Thank you very much, uh, Madam Clerk. We are uh, now returning. It is about 545. Uh, welcome, uh, members of council and staff and uh, those watching us on Zoom. Uh, Councillor Walker is also with us tonight, uh, folks, as far as the quorum goes. He is attending uh, virtually into the meeting. So, Councillor Walker, welcome. And members of our staff are also welcoming or on board here as well. Okay, we are in the council chambers. It is uh, Monday, June the 13th, 2022. And uh, our council meeting did meet at 4.30 for an in-camera session. We've now returned. And uh, uh, one further point is the deputy mayor is just stepped away from a few minutes. He will be returning back to the meeting. Uh, so we are going to now continue with our regular agenda. And at this time, I'd like to start the meeting off with our land acknowledgement. Uh, we'd like to begin our meeting by recognizing the First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples of Canada as traditional stewards and caretakers of the land. We acknowledge that Clearview Township is located within the boundaries of Treaty 18, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Tiantari, the Wendat, and is home to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples as part of the intricate nationhood that reaches across Turtle Island. At this time of truth and reconciliation, we welcome the opportunity to work together towards new understandings and new relationships and ask for guidance in all that we do. Thank you. I say this voluntarily and honored to do so as the mayor of the Township of Clearview. All right. Uh, we are going to get uh, started. Um, we have uh, returned to the council chambers yet again, and we're really happy to have, as I said, a hybrid meeting. And uh, the doors of the council chambers are, in fact, open. And uh, we are still working in a hybrid uh, fashion, and uh, we are looking forward to uh, seeing many members of the public who wish to attend join us at our council meetings in the future. All right, council, moving to item number two on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Recommendation be it resolved that council, the township clear, we hereby approve the agenda dated June 13, 2022, as presented. I'll look for a mover and seconder. Mover on the right, uh, Mr. Lamers, and let's see, Councillor Deneen. Thank you very much. Any questions? Council, seeing none, I'll call the motion. All those in favor? In favor. Thank you. And Councillor Walker's there too. Thank you. That carries. All right, Council. Item three is disclosure of peculiar interest and general nature thereof. Is there anything that, for disclosures uh, during this meeting? Councillor Deneen, go ahead. I won't be voting on CS-033-2022. It's a zoning bylaw amendment for 143-145 Mill Street in Cremor, as I believe I am employed by the, the uh, applicant. Oh, thank okay. you. All right, well, thank you very much. And as, uh, as conflicts are, are recorded, we ask you, you fill out the appropriate forms and file them with the clerk. Thank you very much. Uh, anything further from council for disclosures? Seeing none, we'll, uh, if anything comes up during the meeting, please uh, bring it forward. Item four is our public participation. Uh, again, public participation at this time is still in the virtual form where we ask members to fill out the correct form, members of the public to fill out the correct form on the council public participation uh, portal available on our website. Uh, I'll read the disclaimer, although we have none tonight, be advised that comments and views expressed under public participation period are not the views of the Township of Clearview Council or the administration, and written comments will be received until 12 noon on June 13, 2022, and any submissions received after that will be added to the, to the council meeting further in the month. Uh, one other thing I could point out is that uh, at council's pleasure, uh, once we work out all the bugs with our hybrid meeting formats that we may have public participation join us here in the chambers once again so we'll have that discussion at a future meeting but at this time council we will continue with public participation by virtual portal connection and so we'll, we'll see how this all works out you know times are changing right the covid rules are starting to to change a little bit we're all getting used to it all right now we are going to go to uh, item five, which is uh, deputations and presentations. Now we do have a deputation tonight who is joining us virtually. Marg Shivanidi is uh, here. So Madam Clerk, if we could bring Marg Shivanidi into the meeting, because uh, she's going to join us virtually. And she has a presentation regarding a regional affordable housing task force. And uh, it'll be very interesting to hear from her. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I believe Marg is in the meeting. Marg, you may address council. Thank you very much. It's nice to see everybody back in council live. <laughs> I'm just going to take a moment and share my screen.
Okay. Almost. So thank you, Mayor Measures and yes. Deputy Mayor Burton and members of council for allowing me to present to you today. It's not news to anyone that we have a housing crisis on our hands. Um, we've become almost blind to the word home and instead we've become addicted to property speculation and growing real estate wealth. Housing is kind of like a competitive sport where only those with the highest incomes or assets win. This really is not good news for our communities and our future sustainability. So last year, a group of housing advocates, two members of your council uh, and other interested parties decided we wanted to look at the housing issue in South Georgian Bay uh, as a region and look at it in greater depth. So we spent eight months researching, learning, and gathering ideas from all sectors. We did have a, an excellent presentation from your own Mara Burton. And our purpose now is we wanna share with you just a tiny bit of that learning and to spark action in our region that can see us all working together and sharing a common understanding of this complex issue and how we move forward. So, huh. How did we get here? Many things, but the world has changed. Single family zoning came to Canada around 1920. Now we have less than half the number of people living in each house than we did then. Land was cheap and it was plentiful. In 1941, there were 2.2 million households in Canada, but today there are over 14 million. A few short decades ago, things like real estate investment trusts or REITs Short-term rentals, condominiums, and house flipping were unknown. I imagine HGTV wasn't around either. Housing has changed from being a home to being a commodity as the wealth gap and the inequities in housing are continuing to grow. We simply can no longer absorb the population growth and demographic changes unless we unblock densification and start working collectively to change as the world has changed. We know that this is a really scary and complex issue, but when people don't have affordable housing, regardless of their income level, they don't have enough dollars left at the end of the month to eat well. There's not enough disposable income to shop local. We can't maintain or grow our labor force. We start to lose businesses and all of this is already happening. This really is a problem for everyone in the community and not just those who lack adequate housing. It affects all of us. We also know that housing is quite likely going to be the number one issue in the upcoming municipal elections in the fall. The good news is that you as a municipal council do have a significant role to play and can be part of the solution. So a healthy community, it includes all forms of housings and tenures to meet the needs of residents who move around in this continuum throughout their life. <clears throat> Excuse me, but despite this, for many years, the focus has al almost exclusively been on market rate housing, and in particular, ownership versus purpose built rentals. So, the first thing we need to do is understand the term affordable housing. Affordable means spending no more than 30% of gross household income on shelter costs, including rent or mortgage payments, realty taxes, and utilities, period. It doesn't matter if you make 20,000 a year or 200,000 a year. Affordable housing does not only refer to social housing. It refers to housing that is affordable to every section of society. Whoops. Um, so what, you got a copy of the report, I believe, with your agenda, and it includes all kinds of data that can soon be updated when the new census info comes out next month. Understanding our local reality is where we started. We've got all kinds of data tables in there, but then what? According to the 2016 census, over 5,500 households in our area were in core housing need, meaning that they were living in unaffordable, inadequate and or unsuitable housing. That was in 2016 when the median price of a house was just under $400,000 in our region and today it's over a million. So what might that core housing number be today? We know that four times as many renter households are in core housing need compared to homeowners. 
Renters median gross household incomes are on average only 50% of those of homeowner families. So this is what it looked like in South Georgian Bay. In the region, the median gross household income before taxes in 2016, and that's probably shifted about 10%, uh, was 62,700. But this is where it's really interesting in that owner's incomes were, you can see here, roughly double, almost double of what a renter household income was. So when we talk about affordable housing or targeting units for renters, we need to be looking at renter incomes. We know that the greatest and most pressing need today for affordable is for affordable rental housing if we want to have sustainable local communities. Based on these numbers, uh, a middle income renter family in our region shouldn't be spending more than about $1,000 a month on um, shelter costs. But we know that's simply impossible in our area without intervention or significant changes in policy direction. One of the first things we looked at was the rate at which we're losing housing stock. A study that was done in Ottawa recently showed that they lost 15 affordable housing units for every one created. If we look at South Georgian Bay, we've lost untold numbers of affordable housing units to gentrification, vacancy decontrol, short-term rental accommodations, property sales and demolitions. Rooming houses have been converted to boutique hotels. Tenants have been displaced when their homes have been sold. And we've seen demolition of affordable units in favor of supersized homes. While this has been happening, how many affordable units have been created in our region? I would suggest that our ratio is far greater than 15 to one. So it starts with preserving the units we have. And while this won't solve the whole problem, municipalities do have tools at their disposal. For example, rental replacement bylaws to help tackle this challenge. Most government initiatives have been focused on increasing housing supply. However, adding to supply without attaching affordability metrics won't help to solve the problem. Secondly, municipalities often defer to the county to address this issue, but social housing and affordable housing are two different things. Outside of overarching land use planning, the county does have a role as the provincially appointed service manager to address social housing with things such as subsidized or rent geared to income uh, housing. <clears throat> and while this is critically important, it doesn't speak to complete communities with housing for all. Municipalities can, are, and must play a critical role in ensuring that the right supply is built. Municipalities can work with all stakeholders, and indeed it takes all stakeholders, such as other levels of government, developers, philanthropists, the business community, not-for-profit entities, working together to find innovative solutions. For example, the town can encourage and seed the formation of not-for-profit entities that work to remove land from the speculative market and preserve them for the creation of affordable housing in future. Secondly, we took a look at all the tools that are available to municipalities and, and there's many. It starts with the official plans, of course, which are currently under review and then the implementing zoning bylaws. For example, what percentage of your residential lands are zoned for just single family housing? In uh, Canada, that number is over 70%. There's a global trend toward eliminating single family zoning as we require density and supply to accommodate a growing population with smaller average household sizes. Are there shovel ready lands available for affordable housing to help reduce the planning timeframes in future? Planning ahead may also allow greater access to financial opportunities through other levels of government. Towns can incentivize new unit creation through things such as community improvement plans, municipal capital facilities bylaws, and the inclusion of affordable housing in development charges or community uh, benefits, which are the financial contribution paid to the municipality when land is developed. As I said at the outset, it's a complex issue, uh, but by taking the time to listen and, and read the report, and you'll see a few pages of municipal toolkit in there, 
uh, we hope that you can help in bringing the community closer to solving the problem. We recommend that municipalities see the need for affordable housing as a critical priority in their strategic planning. For this reason, we envision that each municipality in our region of South Georgian Bay have a dedicated affordable housing committee and ideally a point person on staff to help create and monitor an affordable housing master plan. Collecting, analyzing and utilizing data, setting targets, identifying community needs, all aid in the decision-making and allow for adjustments in the year, years ahead. It gives an opportunity for councils to look at best practices and options that fit the local needs. We envision that if each community in South Georgian Bay had such a committee, there could then be a regional committee with members from each of the surrounding towns and cities to work together to collectively share ideas, best practices, and look for opportunities to work together. Collingwood and the town of Blue Mountains both have committees, and I'm happy to report that just this afternoon, Meaford voted also to form a committee, and we are hoping that you will join in that initiative. After all, it is urgent. And if we don't act now, when? Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Great to uh, get an update on some of that information and some of the uh, uh, future viewing that you're offering. Um, I uh, would look to members of council if they have any questions to Mark or any comments. Yes, Councillor Patterson is up first. I'll look around, is there anybody else? Councillor McKechnie, then Leishman, thank you. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Patterson. Yeah, thank you for uh... Uh, jolting our thoughts about this uh, a little bit. Um, without, without deciding whether or not it's uh, possible to do this, what would you, in your mind, would be better to, to do this at a municipal level or a regional level? Good question. Straight to you, Mark. Thank you. Through you, Your Worship, to Councillor Patterson. Um, I actually personally have experience on, on both in that I do sit on a municipal task force and uh, our feeling is that it's most helpful to be operating through the municipality, one for the support of staff. It is a complex, complex topic uh, impacted by Planning Act legislation, um, the PPS, all of that type of thing. So I think that's important that the municipality be involved. And I also think it's important if it's a committee of council that there may be an opportunity for councillors to participate on such a committee as well as the general public. And again, it's a matter of working together. So that would be my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Councilor McKechnie is next, then Leishman. I'll look around the table. Anybody else? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I have uh, one question for Marg, and I have one question for our clerk, if you don't mind. Uh, I'll start uh, with uh, Marg uh, first. Uh, so I've noticed uh, on social media, there's uh, over the last couple of years, there's been a, a definite increase in uh, the number of people uh, looking for affordable housing immediately. They've been desperate for it. And uh, uh, you know, my heart goes out to them, really. Uh, what I'm wondering about uh, in your presentation, you mentioned uh, about encampments in the South Georgian Bay Area. Are there do, are there any encampments? I'm thinking, uh, you know, like uh, tent cities or anything like that, or communities in the South Georgian Bay Area, like what we see in Toronto and some of the parks. Uh, anything like that around here just yet? Marg, any tent cities that you're aware of? Uh, yes, and thank you for that question. This topic is not just about uh, homelessness, but I'm glad you asked it because it is a major issue in our area. There are encampments come and go and they move about, but they certainly do exist in all of the municipalities in our region. Okay, uh, thank you. And a follow up uh, you, uh, for the clerk, uh, your worship. So uh, the uh, the last slide there. Uh, one of the things that we can do as a community or as a municipality is uh, set up an affordable housing uh, committee. And I noticed that Mark said that already. Uh, Town of the Blue Mountains, Collingwood, Meaford have done so. If we set one up, would that be a part of uh, the maybe the economic development committee, or, or or would it be a standalone committee? How uh, how would we proceed uh, to do that? 
I'm interested in this answer as well. Yeah. Uh, Clerk. Through your worship to Councillor McKechnie, without having defined terms of reference and a mandate from council, it would be me just, just assuming that it would be its own standalone committee. But I believe in my conversations with Councillor Leishman that she had had some ideas of a report that she would possibly want to be bringing forward to council as she sat on this, this task force with Councillor Deneen. So um, I might defer to Connie because I believe she has some information she wants to provide council. So thank Councillor, you. Councillor Leishman, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. That was great. And it's so good to see you. I have to tell you all, I've never met her in person. What? <laughs> We've really? always done everything virtually since last April 2021. It's been a long road and it's been a while before we got this report to you. Um, but I'm glad it's here because we did a lot of work on it and we talked to a lot of people and it was really an eye opener for me. Um, I don't see homeless people in Stainer or Clearview, but they're here. They sleep in their cars. These are people that have full-time jobs and can't afford homes. It's crazy. Anyway, we talked to them all. But uh, what I wanted to tell you is that I will be bringing a report to council next meeting um, about this. And uh, there might be a motion with it. I haven't decided yet. Anyway, thank you, Mark. Thank you. All right, so back to Councilor McCackney. That help that answers your questions. Oh, the clerk no, that's to... great. Uh, I'm glad that Connie is uh, is on this because I was just wondering how we proceed from here. So we'll leave it up to Connie, and I, I look forward to the next meeting. So thank you. Excellent. I'd like to acknowledge Councilor Deneen too, who's done a great job on that committee. Yes, worked with yes. Councilor Leishman and uh, attended many of these meetings, but. I suspect you've met Mark Fibonetti before in person, have you not? Yes, yeah, we've met once or twice. There you go. <laughs> yes, yeah, over the years, yes. In fact, when I started my career in real estate, Mark was my first employer. Well, there you go. And that was, what, 25 years ago, long Mark? Time. Yes, a long, long, time. a long time ago, anyway. All right, yes. you had a question, Councillor, you want to bring up? No, I just, I just wanted to thank Mark for coming and doing this for us. And I uh, really, really appreciate seeing it. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, I look forward to Connie's motion as well. Thanks. Excellent. All right, members of council, anything further? Okay, so I've got a question to Mark. Mark and I met uh, briefly for a coffee, which was wonderful to, uh, to see you once again in person. And uh, Mark, you and I talked briefly about the relationship between the municipal government, the upper tier municipal government, as in the county, than the province of Ontario and, and the national federal government uh, and, and their responsibilities to assist us, the lower tier municipality with this challenge, uh, as in to create the tools. Now you mentioned it in your report and you mentioned in our conversation about our, our official plan, which uh, I believe is the, is the tool that we have the ability to, to exercise and to use and to create the, uh, the environments for uh affordable housing builds if property owners wish to do so so i'm just wondering would you and your committee and or your future task force regional task force uh make it a a, a program to enter into discussions directly with the feds the province about these about these concerns and how municipal governments have no legislated authority to provide that services that you've recommended. I mean, in your report, you, you said even mortgage insurance, we can't do that. Like it's not within our ability to do that. So would you be able to do that, Marg, with your committee? Is that something that your future committee can do is to work with upper tiers? That's a really, really interesting question um, as to whether we could or not. And there's certainly those discussions are going on at all levels. I'm participating in a national committee right now with CMHC and there's many engaged people across the country working with the provinces and the federal government. Um, I think for municipalities, it, certainly the focus should be on what you can do as opposed to what you can't do. And there are a lot of things municipalities can do and a regional committee would be a wonderful way to share that information and share best practices. And I would also say that members of our regional um, team, I know would be happy to work with your staff in assisting drafting frames of reference and the kinds of things that municipalities do have uh, in their toolkit and at their disposal beyond the official plan and what they can do. 
but I would certainly think it would be wonderful if we had a regional committee in South Georgian Bay championing this issue at higher levels of government. I'd be all for that. Well, there you go. That's what it would be my hope that the committee would reach that uh, ability to create that attention of the federal and provincial government that need to come to provide the tools for individual property owners to access uh, support, and I mean finances, to support creating affordable housing opportunities. So again, as I expressed to you when we met, when I've expressed my deep regret that the municipality does not have that authority now. So we don't have that. So we need to be able to find a way to work with the province and the federal government to assess that. So thank you, Mark. And anybody else with anything further? All right. Well, listen, thank you very much for being a, a wonderful guest to our meeting here tonight and bringing a very good presentation of something that gives us something to really consider on how we work regionally. Thank you. All the best, Mark. Have a great evening. You too. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. All right, members of council, we're going to move on in our agenda. And uh, item six is our public meetings, which I don't believe we have anything scheduled for tonight. So we're going to move to item seven, which is approval of the council meeting minutes. I think we have two here. So I'll read them and look for a mover and seconder. Be it resolved, council, the township clearly hereby approve the minutes of the following council meetings as presented May 25, 2022, a special council meeting. That was a planning public meeting. Uh, May 30, 2022, a regular council meeting. Can I have a mover and seconder on that one? Mr. Broderick, looking this way. Ms. Uh, Deneen, thank you. Any questions on the minutes? I'll call the motion. All those in favor? In favor. Thank you. Uh, business arising from the minutes? Oh, that carries. Um, business arising? Anybody get anything from there? No? Okay. Communications from the mayor. Uh, yes, we did have a closed session uh, under 9.1. There is nothing for us to report in open session from that meeting. If we will go to item 9.2, I had a, an email sent to me, members of council, from this organization asking for a uh, proclamation request, and I shared it with the clerk, and the clerk shared it with you on this agenda. So I will uh, read it and look for a mover and seconder on this recommendation. Uh, be it resolved, the Council of the Township Clearview hereby requests the Mayor proclaim June 19, 2022 as the longest day of smiles to encourage community ambassadors to raise awareness and funds to help child born with cleft condition smile and change their life with free, safe cleft surgery and comprehensive care. There's uh, full information in the report if you wanted to read it. I'll look for a mover and seconder. Councillor Deneen, seconded by Deputy Mayor Burton. I thank you. Any questions? Oh, good. I'll call the motion. All those in favor. In favor. And we carry that with a big smile. Madam Clerk, we'll prepare that, uh, that resolution for my signature this week. Thank you. Uh, item 9.3 is the NBCA board meeting highlights. Uh, is there anything from that that any members have any questions for? Uh, Councillor Patterson, anything you'd like to add? Nope. Okay. Thank you. All right, then I'll do the uh, recommendation here. Be it resolved, Council of the Township clear we hereby receive communications from the mayor for information. Uh, moved by Councillor Walker, seconded by Deputy, or sorry, Department. by <laughs> Councillor Broderick. Thank you very much, Councillor Walker. Uh, all those in favor? In favor. Favor. I'm hearing a voice. Is it just me? Oh, is it from coming from your house, Bob? Okay, sorry. It's good. Okay, I could hear a voice. Wasn't sure where it's coming from. Uh, okay, let's move on to county reports. We've got a few items here in county reports. Uh, Deputy Mayor Burton, 10.1, uh, 10.2, uh, 10.3 are all news releases and correspondence regarding the establishment of the library information. Barry, would you have anything you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I just I think these reports are sort of self-explanatory. Um, <clears throat> the, the survey on waste programs is county's trying to get a handle on you know what type of waste is being out what how to service the community better and how to deal with our you know our waste management uh, which is always you know always a problem for any municipality whether it's upper tier or lower tier um one of the things that have happened in the past item number 10.2 is the fact that the archives were closed due to uh COVID and all that so now they've they're uh, the online booking portal, so you can make an, an appointment to go uh, search through archives, archives to find out uh, information that you require. 
and the corresponding establishment of the information library service. And uh, I think we discussed that uh, at some length there not too long ago. And um, it just gives you the outline of the services that are available. So uh, if I may read the recommendation. Uh, yes, what would you like to do? Just read, be it resolved that the Council oh. of Dungeons will receive county reports for information. Okay. Thank well, you. Thank you worship. for reading that. Appreciate that. I just uh, thought I'd give you a break there. I, well, thank you. We'll consider it read, and I'll consider you the mover. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, is there any questions for any of the three items before we look for a seconder? Is there any questions? Anybody have any questions? All right. Uh, FYI, Jennifer LaChapelle, our CEO of the library, is available if you had any questions regarding the information library service. All right. Seeing none, I'll look for a second around the motion then. Councillor Leishman, thank you very much. And seeing no further discussion, I'll call the motion. All those in favor? And in favor. thank you. That carries unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Burton. Well done, sir. Good little. I like the change there. I like it. I'm all good with that. It's okay. You know, look at every day there's change happening. So we're getting used to it here. Okay. It's okay. She's got to follow the puck. <laughs> Item 11 is our council reports and community announcements, award reports. Uh, Mr. Walker, you gave me heck last week to start at the other end. So I'm going to start with you since you're on my screen. How's that? Uh, that's fine. It's nice to be number one for a change. You are in our heart every day. <laughs> um, just a quick uh, June 1st was youth committee. And um, I have asked that the um, director's report, youth coordinator's report be forwarded through to council, um, either through um, under the mayor's information or through the parks and recreation account, just so members of council can review that report. Um, and the public can see it as well once it's a pass and becomes a public document. But uh, some highlights from that youth committee. Um, activity kits are still going forward. We're down to 50 activity kits every two months because the, uh, we're now open. So therefore, there's no need to do it every month. But we're still busy with that. Um, April, we saw 55 different youth. Um, numerous times, but 55 different youth uh, use the facility. And in May, 65 different youth use that facility. So that could mean that we could have had 200 people in there over the month, but 65 different um, individuals. Um, June 4th, then I attended the uh, Trailhead uh, concerts and uh, a great day uh, to those that organized it. Uh, thank you. It was just a really good afternoon to sit there and morning and enjoy. Um, and that was uh, through the uh, Collingwood Clearview and Wasaga. Uh, I hope it becomes an annual uh, that event. It was really good. And uh, I guess that's it, Your Worship. Uh, just to further, I will be leaving about seven o'clock from the meeting uh, as I have another appointment uh, in Own Sound. All right. Thank you very much, Councillor Walker, for your report. And uh, when you do leave the meeting, if you could just acknowledge that to me, then that we, we can see you and we'll, uh, we'll wish you all the best. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks very much, Robert. Good stuff. Uh, Councillor Lamers will be next, then Patterson, then Deneen. Hi, John. Good afternoon. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, yeah, not much. Uh, June 4th attended the Trail Tunes. It was a nice, bright, sunny afternoon or day. It was beautiful out there, listening to all the different music. And then uh, June 10th and 11th, I attended... Uh, a couple of the uh, lacrosse games. Uh, Stainer had a tournament uh, between Creemore, Stainer, and Collingwood Arenas. They had ages from young to old. And it uh, teams came from all over Ontario in a variety of ages. And a big thanks to all the volunteers to put this all together. It was a great weekend. And nice. I don't know how these kids put up with getting beat around like that. <laughs> it was well, a great day. Lacrosse can get your heart rate up, boy. boy. That's <laughs> good stuff. Yeah. That's great. I, I felt some of the pain that they were getting hit. <laughs> Fair enough. What a great sport. What a great sport. Thank you very much, Councillor Lambert. Councillor Patterson. Hello, Dom. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, since we uh, 
discuss the patio parking and pedestrians motion the last meeting i've been receiving comments from the public and i've encouraged them to uh, document them as simply as putting them in an email and pass them on or send them in to our staff so giving them some instructions there um, for the most part they're um, they see the the need for they welcome the, the addition of the patios they're worried about parking and they want to see some protection for for um, pedestrians so they're, they're waiting to see what we're doing and uh, they're not opposed to patios but they're also concerned about losing spots so I think we've started the what I consider a healthy discussion on that um, and I've been invited and I've accepted the um, invitation from the NCPS school for graduation. So the ceremony is to bring greetings from the township on uh, June 27th. Yes. If I may, Councillor, uh, I also was invited and found it to be the date of our council meeting. I know that, so. So you may be missing the council meeting or part of the council meeting to attend? I may be on on the go on Zoom and at the meeting <laughs> and the graduation Wonderful. within five minutes of each other. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I, I appreciate being invited to, to it as well. Uh, I declined because I knew that I'd need to be here. So I appreciate that you can cover for that and do that. That's great. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Excellent. Councillor Deneen, how are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. And yourself? Good, good. 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 I'm not going to keep anybody. It has been quiet around around our ward. Um, everybody's getting out and everybody's visiting with people. We're seeing people. We're getting together again. And that's about it for us. And it's just going to get better from here on in. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Councillor. Let's hope for a beautiful summer. Deputy Mayor Burton, you're next. And then Leishman and then Broderick and then McKechnie. Go ahead, Barry. Like I said, uh, mainly, you know, I talked about the county stuff, you know, and what's going on at county. Uh, we have an economic development committee meeting tomorrow as well as county council committee of the whole. And things are progressing with economic development uh, at the county level. And uh, other than that, what's just been happening in the community is like people are out, people are seeing it's good to see people uh, participating and out walking around without masks on. But it's uh, about all I have to report. All right. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you at county council tomorrow. Uh, Councillor Leishman, you're up next. How are you doing, Connie? Thank you. Excellent. Um, okay, Thursday the 2nd, I attended Music Market and Park It. I wasn't there for the opening, but we got there early. Uh, what I did do was I went to the SCI Arts Night mm -hmm. because my granddaughter played the alto sax. So it was lovely. There are some amazing artists out there, music, acting, and um, painting and art, sculptures as well. Um, it's a very creative school and it's, it's, the school's really big in my heart. Um, okay. So I also, on Saturday, the 4th, I went to Joyce Smith's Celebration of Life in Lowell. Joyce, if, for those who don't know, was a counselor on Clearview. Um, she was also very instrumental in having the new Lowell Library built. So, which is almost paid off, actually. It is. Woo -woo. Um, and also the engineers were at Sunnydale Hall last week doing the final run through and I couldn't be happier. So I think that's pretty. Oh, the other thing is um, if anybody has a solution for a stupid cardinal that won't stop hitting my windows because he sees his reflection, I would love to hear it. I can't cover all my windows. It's ridiculous. And he goes all around the house. He also attacks uh, mirrors on cars, my car. Oh. any craps all down the side it's really lovely i if somebody's got a solution please email me i would love to hear it thank you all right we're going to need some av and advice here for the counselor good luck with that <laughs> okay thank you counselor for your report and thank you for mentioning the uh uh the this sci uh arts night yes yeah, so i was uh, also aware of that but Again, double booking is getting crazy for us right now. It's a busy time. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. Uh, Councilor Broderick, how are you doing, John? Good. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, actually, we had a pretty busy weekend. Rhonda and I uh, spent the weekend down in St. Catharines at the Ramesses uh, Shrine Ceremonial with uh, members of the 
local Manitou Shrine Club, uh, we had a presentation from uh, one of our shrine kids, and it was such a, a great reminder of, of, uh, of the work that the, uh, the kids' hospitals can do. Um, she was a, uh, a spinal uh, uh, cord patient, and uh, the presentation actually showed from her uh, basically the story of her life. Um, it uh, certainly brought uh, tears to the eyes, but the, the end product was incredible, and she was there. She gave the presentation, and uh, wow. it was quite a thing to see. Um, and from that, I'm going to go on to, uh, upcoming stuff. Uh, tomorrow we have the, uh, Clearview Accessibility Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, also tomorrow night will be the, uh, the BIA meeting. Um, and also the, uh, the Clearview Sports and Culture Hall of Fame, uh, gala is set for tomorrow evening. Um, the... Clearview Chamber of Commerce will meet on Wednesday. The Board and Air Show is, is this weekend. And uh, the Clearview Canada Day uh, Parade uh, is set uh, for July 1st. Uh, uh, Central Ontario ATV Club uh, will be organizing it this year and are looking for help from everyone. Uh, the Creamore, uh, or Creamore will be having the fireworks uh, uh, July 1st evening as well, hosted by the Remore Legion. And that is it for me. All right. You have been busy. Thank you very much for that update and uh, look forward to, uh, to seeing how your agenda works out for tomorrow with all those meetings you have. <laughs> Perhaps we'll see you at the Sports Hall of Fame. Excellent. Councillor McKechnie, how are you doing, Doug? I'm just great, uh, Your Worship. And uh, to follow up on what Councillor uh, Deneen was saying there, yes, I have to say it. It is nice that we've finally recovered from these depressing, yeah. dark, bleak times. But enough about the provincial election. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, so I, I attended the uh, case management conference uh, for the uh, cannabis bylaw appeal uh, last week, just sort of sat in and monitored it, and uh, it was very cordial, and uh, the lawyers for the parties, they will be uh, meeting, I believe, this week and, uh, and discussing things, so that, that moves along. I uh, also went to uh, the Celebration of Life for an Ottawa resident, Kirk McKenzie. Uh, he was a lifelong Ottawa resident, a good friend of mine growing up, and it was good to go there and catch up with some of my old Ottawa buddies and it was a very nice tribute to Kirk and a celebration of his life and uh, what I think I see Dan Perot still up there what I was uh, wondering if maybe Dan could uh, if I could use this word report time if Dan could just bring us up to speed on what's happening on concession 10 I see there's some paving going on I haven't been down the road Dan uh, it's a paving uh, uh, it's not the whole length that's been paved is it oh Dan welcome aboard well, your worship through to Councillor McKechnie. Uh, yeah, so just this past, I believe it was Wednesday or Thursday of last week, the contractor uh, paved the base course asphalt on phase one. Um, so the first, the, the, the most southern half of that, uh, that project was done uh, last week. Like I said, the base course asphalt. Uh, there are a few more driveways to uh, repair or get, get right for the residents along that first phase stretch. And um, I just received on my desk, I believe it was Thursday, Friday as well, uh, contract documents that I have to bring forward to council's next meeting for phase two works. So that's where, about where we're at. Uh, contractor really can't start until after July 1st anyway uh, for in water works uh, timing through the uh, NEC permit, Nautosaga Valley Conservation Authority, the DFO. Um, so th those works will uh, will ramp up very shortly uh, if council approves uh, my report next, next uh, council meeting. Okay, thank you. That's encouraging, thanks. All right, thank you, Dan, and thank you, Councilor McKechnie. Excellent. Uh, I've got a couple items, if I may. I don't usually have a whole lot to report, but I actually have several things I wanna talk about tonight. Um, first of all, 
uh, Councillor Broderick uh, mentioned the board and air show. Uh, if you recall, uh, members of council, council supported the resolution to support the air show uh, with uh, sponsorship. And part of that sponsorship was that we received a group of uh, general admission passes and those passes were uh, arrived here and our clerk, if I could ask Sasha, just explain what we did with those passes. Uh, thank you, Worship. Through you to the rest of council. So the mayor and council asked that um, that those free complimentary passes for both the Saturday and Sunday admission uh, be divvied up between our volunteers. So what we did, we did the old fashioned way. We put all of our volunteers on our committee and boards, put their names in a hat and have pulled their names out of the hat. And we let them know that they that they were the winners of those free complimentary tickets. Uh, we did ask if they weren't able to use them, just let us know and we would keep drawing some, some names and some volunteers said, thank you, but we're not able to use them. Please pass them on to the next volunteers. And we've been doing that. So, and they're very grateful for council to have that little extra special thing for them. So. Thank you. I just wanted the council to be updated on the follow that up that uh, we did do that. Uh, if you recall, when we debated that, we discussed that way back <laughs> when, when we did that recommendation. Okay, so on June the 2nd, of course, the music market and park had kicked off for the season. Councillor Leishman mentioned that. Uh, the opening ceremony was lovely to uh, to be at the, uh, at the gazebo with uh, many members of the public there and members of the Kinsmen, of course, had their booth. And so it was a pleasure to be there. I would like to acknowledge that June the 2nd was also the, the start of the Queen's Jubilee. And so in honor of that, I arranged to have the Union Jack flying uh, proudly at the, uh, at the flagpole there in the, in, the, uh, in the park. And then arranged for Dean Holland, who's a local amazing vocalist to come and sing God Save the Queen. So we want to wish Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, Queen of Canada, all the health and, and uh, hope that her Jubilee has been successful for her and for the entire Commonwealth. Uh, following that, uh, the trail tunes, which was mentioned by a few members here. I tell you what, that was a really exciting event uh, down in Centennial Park and also in Collingwood and in Wasaga Beach. Uh, just so you know, I did have the opportunity to go to Collingwood and sit at their amphitheater for one of the performances. And that was a really great uh, a venue as well. So I got a bit of a taste for how the event went across the region. And I do think that it was very really positive and a good level of cooperation between our uh, municipalities to do this trails event. It was held on International Trails Day, so it was kind of significant. <laughs> anyway, it was, a, it was a really good event. So thank you for those that participated. Uh, last week, uh, I was invited by the county to attend the Warden's Gala fundraiser for the United Way. And I just wanted to mention that because the, uh, the United Way uh, impacts many uh, charities and organizations across all of Simcoe County. Uh, the United Way was the recipient of over $30,000 worth of fundraising at that event. So it was quite a nice event to, to be there. And uh, it was one of the last uh, sort of uh, big public appearances at an at a open microphone for our warden, George Cornell, who is uh, going to finish out his term here uh, at the end of this, uh, this term and is not seeking re-election. So it was quite a nice event for George to, uh, to be there and, and to also be recognized for his service to uh, his community and to this, uh, this county. So Warden Cornell uh, did a very good job at that event. And I look forward to seeing all of you, many members of the public and many of the recipients for the Clearview uh, Sports Hall of Fame, Sports and Culture Hall of Fame tomorrow evening. So I look forward to seeing you all, uh, all there. I'm sure the tuxedos are being pressed as we speak. I'm just teasing. <laughs> so hopefully uh, I'll see, uh, see many of you there. That is uh, all I wanted to add to my report tonight. So thank you, council. We're gonna move on in the agenda. Straight over to public works. We've got a few items here uh, for public works. Uh, I certainly will call upon Mike, I think, to, to talk to some of these. There are two recommendations. What I'd like to do is I'll read the first one. We'll look for a mover and seconder. Then we'll have uh, maybe Mike do a, a good presentation to us, uh, ask some questions, and we'll take a look at the second recommendation as well. After we pass the first one, they're both related. So I'll get right to it. Um, PW023-2022 is the Cremor Water and Wastewater Capacity Update. Uh, it's a recommendation, be it resolved, that Council of the Township Clearview hereby receive report PW023-2022 Cremar Water Wastewater Capacity Update dated June 13, 2022 for information. So a mover and seconder. 
Uh, Deneen, seconded. Hello. Looking to the left, seconded. Councillor Patterson, thank you. And uh, Mr. Ron, how are you, Mike? Uh, I know you want to speak about this as well as the, the second report as well, so we can tie a lot of some of these, these uh, comments in together. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, and we do have uh, Jeff Langwas with us. Uh, he is online now um, with RJ Burnside and Associates, the author of the heavy lifting. <laughs> okay. um, so for the, the first report, Your Worship, uh, the capacity report, it's, I, I will just say the reason for some of these length reports is something I learned a long time ago. It's very beneficial when trying to figure out how things started and where things went to be able to go back through and follow these council reports back to, you know, where all the, uh, where the issues started um, and, and how we're getting through them. So that's the reason for some of the length of these. The first report is um, a capacity update again, only for information and for mostly if anyone has any questions. Um, council recall back in October of 21, um, Jeff and Burnsides wrote us a capacity memo uh, we had some preliminary testing done. Prior to that, there was zero capacity in Creamore sewer plant for any development, including um, any severances. Uh, we put new membranes into plants. The capacity was tested and checked. Um, that report told us we had about 108 units of capacity. Um, knowing that, we got to go forward with the MDM development, the condos at the old school site, some infill lots were severed and serviced. Um, part of the ongoing testing and the feasibility study for the wastewater plant in Creamore was to also do um, testing on the membranes when the, when the weather was warmer. So that report is included. I'm going to let Jeff speak to that if, if council has any questions about that report. Um, I, I think if, if I could understand all of what Blue Sky has been done with that plant, <laughs> I would probably be working for somebody like Blue Sky. It's very technical and it's a very complex plant. Um, yeah, a um, couple other things, I guess. So along the way, we've been talking about, you know, um, council had a report come in from Tribute and their engineers about a pre-treatment solution for Creamore Springs Brewery effluent. So that effluent is, is challenging to treat. Um, Creamore Springs does pay um, a fairly hefty fee for, for us to treat that sewage. Um, it's through agreement with the township. We're moving forward, looking at that as an option. If we could pre-treat Creamore Springs effluent, it would certainly be beneficial to the sewer plant. So we've got actually Creamore Springs engineers and tributes engineers. Um, they're trying to work something out on that regard um that they both think will work well like they've they've each got wastewater engineers hired jeff and burnside would review that as well as council it'll be a public process whenever it whenever they come up with a um call it a concept or a, or a, a design that they think will work so once we get that figured out we need to expand the plant for development we're working with all the developers in creamore the three Sorry, there's three main developers on the east side of town. Together, they're going to need water capacity, sewer capacity, a sewer pumping station, force mains to the sewer plant, um, well, water reservoir, um, also limited capacity in our water system there. And that all leads into the next report, the, the recommendation for the master servicing plan. Um, the, we're going to stop there and ask if, if council have any questions about the capacity report for Jeff. I was going to ask if uh, Mr. Langma wanted to join us and, uh, and then I'll open the, the floor to council. Um, Jeff's online he, now, your worship. Oh, he's there. Okay, good. All right. Just so you know, uh, those that are at home and, and those that are actually virtual, we see the speaker on the screen, whoever's speaking at this time. So um, I know Mr. Langwa is there, so I'll, I'll count on him when, when he, we draw upon him to uh, to speak up. Members of council, have you got any questions to Mike and or Mr. Langwa? <clears throat> yes, Mr. Patterson, go ahead. Councillor Patterson's up first. Okay. Uh, yes, Jeff, if I may. Um, so we're going with uh, we're going with the cold weather weather uh, processing. Um, 
does that number how does that number relate to the last number that we heard that we had about 108 allocations uh, that which we have uh, uh, allocated to the various some of the uh, projects on file has it changed from from the last review of this uh, I'm assuming it hasn't gone down well, unfortunately, the, the current forecast is a little lower than the previous forecast, <laughs> as you uh, suggested there. So the current number is approximately um, the plants considered to be able to handle on an average basis. Um, I think it's 520 meters cubed per day, uh, whereas the earlier estimate um, was approximately 580 cubic meters per day. Right. Um, so we did go back, back and uh, Mike alluded to a second round of tests because um, the initial test was a warm weather test, which is generally uh, better conditions or more favorable conditions for the treatment process and the flow through the plant. Um, so it was conducted, I believe, in uh, February of this year. So the water was cold um, and Melody had projected what the cold water performance would be um, and unfortunately when we tested it, it's a little uh, worse than the projection. Uh, by sort of the same order of magnitude. And really um, it has gone down, you know, and probably in a percentage point, it's probably down uh, roughly 10%, I guess, from 580 to 520. Um, but the key point is it's um, it's quite short of what it needs to be to satisfy all the development, right? So uh, as much as we would like it to be higher at this time, the township has undertaken some improvements with the membranes um, to try to improve their performance and replacing them on a more frequent basis is something that would help as an interim basis, uh, but it's really just um, fuel to reinforce the need to proceed with the master plan and to derive a longer term solution. Um, the problem will, you know, it's not an everyday problem at the plant because of that reduction in capacity, but um, on a high flow or very, you know, sort of on a bad day, um, the margin for error will be smaller. Um, right now until we get additional works in place. Uh, Tom, the follow-up? I, I, I didn't catch, just because of the transmission, I didn't catch everything you said there, but I caught the gist that, that is slightly down from the projections that we had back in February. Does that mean we, that we are still going ahead with the uh, allocations for existing projects as we stated? Um, uh, some previous discussions or are we taking back some allocation? I understand that, that some of the larger, the larger one tribute is probably not uh, in that category, but there were some, um, I think we all know what they were. There was the uh, 72 unit condo and there's, we distributed some of that. Are we reassessing how, uh, the allocations there? I see uh, Mike Ron is in there. He wants to speak too. So uh, Jeff, did you yeah. want to go ahead first? Actually, I would, with regard to the status of the allocations, I'd defer that to Mike because he'll have more up to date. Okay, let's go to Mike then. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Patterson, to the chair. The the seventy two units from MDM when you when you work them out, so it's those units are um, on an SDE, so a, a single detached equivalent. When we do those calculations, we take the we take the formulas right out of the development charge background study. So a, like a, a two bedroom condo or a two bedroom apartment factor in at 0.6 units. So it's 72 units, but in, in reality, it, it works out to about 56, I think. I'd, I'd have to double check, but it's, it's within one or two units there. So everything that we know that's going forward now is okay, right? The condos, the um, MDM and, and the few infill lots that we know about. As this moves forward, like I said, like the next report, we'll talk about how we've worked with the developers. The CIO has actually led those conversations very well. Mr. Ferguson has chaired all those meetings. We meet with the Creamore development community every two weeks, um, and, and they know what the restrictions are. That's that's why they've actually asked to uh, help fund this study. Um, that and, you know, we explained uh, our debt capacity concerns and, and, and how building infrastructure works in Clearview. Thank you, uh, Mike. Uh, Tom, is that comfortable? Yeah, and, and at some point in this conversation, will you give us a, a scope of the, the timelines now going with the master? So you'll do that today? In the next report. <laughs> in two minutes time. 
Uh, anybody else? Thank you, Tom. Uh, anybody else with any other questions in regards to the capacity issues? No? All right. Uh, we have a mover and seconder on the motion, I believe. So let's, uh, is there anything further? Thank you, Mr. Ron. Do not go away. We'll go to another report here in a moment. Members of council, I'm prepared to call the motion. All those in favor? In that favor. carries unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Walker. I acknowledge you. Uh, we're going to go to the next report, PW024-2022 Cremore Water Wastewater Master Servicing Plan. Uh, be it resolved that Council of the Township of Clearview hereby one receive report PW024-2022 Cremore Water and Wastewater Master Servicing Plan dated June 13, 2022. And direct staff to have R.J. Burnside initiate the Cremore Water and Wastewater Master Servicing Plan as described in this report. And item three, direct staff to negotiate the terms of the funding agreements as described and referenced in the letter of intent in Appendix B and return to Council with agreements for approval. Uh, mover and seconder on this motion, Councillor Patterson. Thank you. Councillor uh, Leishman, I'm looking at. There we go, Leishman. Thank you. Mike, anything further you want to add on this discussion? Um, certainly just in, you know, recap for just about a year and a half, we've been working with uh, the new owners of the Alliance subdivision. Um, very keen to get going. They've got some uh, creative ideas with, uh, you know, pre-servicing with Cremore Springs, like I just mentioned. Um the three main developers on the east and the southeast corner of Creemore, um, the plan, even at its design capacity, would not be able to service all of all of the settlement area of Creemore. All of the other things I've already mentioned with the capacity concerns for water, wastewater, and transmitting sewage. Um, the master servicing plan really is, um, is the best way to deal with this. When, when the county came out with their water and wastewater report for all of the different communities, ours included, you know, it was noted that we were one of very few communities that had not done master servicing plans. And part of that is because it's been the same folks looking after these things for like, like 20 years. And we kind of have a good roadmap of, of what's going to happen. But now with Cremor, you know, Cremor with the issues at the sewer plant and now be, having to build beyond the capacity of the plant, um, the master servicing study, it just it just combines all of the different EAs that we would have to do to solve all the problems. I'm going to let Jeff speak to this. He understands it. Um, you know, he, he's led this. If you uh, happen to look at the appendix, he's actually worked out how many hours it's going to take for all of his different staff members to do all of the different components. That's uh, Appendix A. The other appendix is the uh, letter from, so they the, the, the three main developers have hired a uh, legal consultant. Um, the letter is addressed to Mr. Ferguson, again, who has led this process for us. Um, and we agree with what they recommend in their letter, and we would like to move forward. So if Jeff, would you mind just explaining the, the, the MSP a little bit for council? Yeah, let's go to Jeff. Uh, Mr. Langlois, Sorry. go ahead. Uh, my pleasure, Your Worship, uh, and through Your Worship to Council. Uh, so the master servicing planning process is really a parallel to a municipal class environmental assessment, which most of you would have heard of before. Um, the majority of major infrastructure that gets constructed by municipality does require that a municipal class environmental assessment be prepared. Um, when there are multiple uh, pieces of infrastructure, that need to be constructed. The MSP kind of provides an umbrella that you can look at those problems in parallel. So you don't have like, um, you know, a whole set of circulations related to the reservoir and then in parallel one for the well and in parallel one for the wastewater treatment plant. Um, you do it all sort of uh, together as one process because they really do all share some very common assumptions in terms of the amount of people to be served the water that they need to drink and the wastewater that will come down the other end they're ever related so that is the idea of doing it as a master plan is that it's more um just kind of looking at all the problems at the same time and using uh, unified assumptions across them it will it does remain a, a public process there will be you know mandatory circulations and public information centers and those types of things 
the terms of reference that we prepared was done uh, working closely with the development community. As Mike mentioned, we've been meeting for months now on a biweekly basis. And a big part of that was to develop the terms of reference for the study. Uh, and then quite recently, um, we actually turned that into an estimated fee for them. And okay. that's gone through with their blessing and they've provided their letter of intent to uh, move forward. All right, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, and Mike, if I may, I'd like to just quickly go to Mr. Ferguson. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, the uh, the last item in this recommendation uh, asked for return to council with the approvals of the agreements for approval. Um, is there any process there for that? Would you be bringing individual or just bringing the entire package as a proposal approval for us? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, the uh, developers will have to uh, get themselves together on their portion of the agreement. That determines how many will participate. I believe all the developers that are involved right now intend to do so. And so we'll wrap that up in one package and bring it in at that time. Perfect. Okay, that's what I was hoping to hear. All right, members of council, have you got any further questions? Yes, no? Yes, Tom, go ahead. The calendar of events. I, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Uh, sorry, yes, I remember your question from before. It must, it's been more than two minutes, so I forgot. The, um, sorry about that. You're right. <laughs> um, the timeline that we put forward to the development group, because they are, of course, acutely interested in the timeline on how long it will take to get through this process, is approximately 18 months um, to work its way through the municipal class EA process. And that's the timeline we've shared with them um, to get through it. And I think that's a realistic target, and we should be able to deliver on that. Eight months. Uh, sorry, 18 months, a year and a half. 18 months. Yeah. Again, the uh, the connection with your audio is a little off there, Jeff, just saying. My apologies. One eight, one eight months. Okay, go ahead, Tom. So, so barring any um, fantastic news or um, some pre-work agreements, we're really looking at allocating for construction in 2024. So... Um, if I do the math here, I have a good flow chart that I don't have in front of me. So 2023, 2024 would actually be um, or middle 2022. So just say January of 2024 is a year and a half. That's the time at which detailed designs would start. Um, so they would then be completed and need to go to the ministry for approval. So the actual construction would likely still, you know, be another year to two years after that for most of those facilities. There are some projects expected to go in parallel outside the master servicing plan uh, that we've been discussing with the development group, um, elements of the project which do not need to go through an environmental assessment. Um, and those could initiate earlier. Um, and an example of that is the pretreatment facility that Tribute and Creamore Springs are considering. And that's partly why it's being considered up front and sort of on a separate stream because they believe they can get it um, basically constructed faster. And so we're letting them work on that. Go ahead. So I think I heard um, that you were going to try to do the, uh, the actual development, project development in parallel with uh, the master plan so that we would be ready. Um, the old expression used to be shovel ready, but now we're going to be pipe ready in first quarter of 24. Pipe ready by first quarter of 2024? I think in general that that's too early without having the timeline in front of me. Um, the, the master plan process itself should be done essentially at the start of 2024, which means um, we can initiate designs for an expanded wastewater treatment plant. So really it would probably take three years before that was fully constructed after January 21st, right? Before it was in operation um, to get it designed, approved and constructed. However, it's, it's, there's so many prongs to it. There are elements which I think the development community uh, and the township feel like improvements will be made to the plant in a tighter window to that to try to get capacity. Mike, I see you putting your hand up. Maybe you want to help me out. <laughs> That's what I was just going to get your attention to, Jeff. Uh, go ahead. Uh, if you want to finish up, Jeff, and then go to Mike. Um, well, I think that I mean, Mike's probably ready to jump in. Uh, okay, go ahead, Mike. Go. Mike Braun. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Looks like he's frozen. The internet's running slow from his house. 
Hopefully he'll join us soon. So Jeff, let's just review then while we're waiting for Mike. You think the, the plan will be completed in approximately January, 2024? It'll be... Yeah, yeah, the master plan in December, 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 December 2023, right? January 2024. Yeah. And that means any of the projects that are flagged inside that and primarily, you know, those are going to be scheduled B class environmental assessment projects, then they would proceed to detailed design and construction. But there are some activities which are schedule A activities, which can happen before the study is completed. Um, okay. For example, the development group is actively searching for a groundwater well right now. Um, the drilling rig has already attempted at least one location and I believe has been on site again recently trying to get that and there, um, the expansion of the Creamore Reservoir um, may also be possible as a Schedule A activity and that's being investigated to see if it can be started early. So where there is opportunity to advance it, we're certainly trying to take advantage of that um, and not every improvement to the wastewater treatment plant um, would be delayed till past 2024, but the major stuff will be. Okay, um, if we can just pause then, I think to wait for Mike to jump in, is that right? I think we should hear from Mike one more time before we go for this motion. Is that comfortable? Mm -hmm. uh, I see uh, Sasha is working the phones here, trying to uh, reconnect with Mike. So we'll give it a second here, folks. Just everybody pause. Robert Walker, is this yes, a good time for you to exit? <laughs> yes, I was just going to say, I think uh, while we have a little break, I will uh, exit here from this meeting this evening and uh, wish you the rest of, best of luck for the rest of your meeting and we'll be in touch. And thank you. We'll wish you the best of luck with your uh, appointment. Good luck. Thank you. All well. Go ahead, John Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And uh, while well, Mike is uh, trying to get back on, and and uh, just to help understand, there's really two parts to what's trying to be accomplished here. Um, Tribute is interested in increasing the capacity of the existing uh, sewer treatment plant and their work with Creamore Springs. They're hoping they can get, get as many units out of that particular aspect. And then the second aspect is the development beyond that capacity. And so just to be clear, there's really two things really occurring here. And so uh, Jeff and his team at RJ Burnside will be focusing on those two phases uh, with an appreciation that some developers will be in a different position at different times. All right. Thank you very much, John, and keeping us up to date on that. I see Mike Ron has joined us by alternate connection. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Uh, we have paused the meeting, anticipating you discussing with us more of this uh, calendar update uh, beyond 2024. Go ahead, Mike. Um, I apologize, Your Worship, but there's always more than one way to get through these things. So I'm on my phone with my cellular data in this day and age. Maybe we could have some rural internet come out to old Sunnydale. Sure, um, that'd be great. So I, I think uh, Councillor Patterson's concern was probably you know, timing of, of when capacity may be available. And, and what Jeff was alluding to was as we move through this process, you know, it, it doesn't hinder us from making improvements at the plant. So these, um, these cassettes, when they're new, they treat a lot more affluent. Um, if, if we needed to, we could, we could increase the replacement on those things. You know, some, some centers have those membranes lasting for 15 years where they're, where they're not tasked as much as they are, in Cremor, we're replacing them at every eight, and after eight years, they're just useless. We we could increase the, the replacement on that and increase some of the interim capacity while while we're building a solution. Um, the pre-treatment solution would also help immensely. So combine those two things, and we could probably gain some sewage capacity. Uh, in the meantime, you know we've we've added a backup generator in Cremor so that uh, you know power outages won't affect the water supply. That's new last year and. Um, the reservoir, you know, as it's, as it gets through the, uh, the process and, and we, we will have to increase the reservoir size, 
knowing we have a solution on the way as we have in, in, in Stainer, you know, we can call it risk, but we're not going to take on any risk that would, we wouldn't take on any risk that would, we, we would think would adversely affect the drinking water system. You know, that being said, if we know there's going to be a storage solution in place in two years from now, well, we could maybe go a little lower than the MOE design guideline to allow some, some houses to be built with the existing storage. MOE design guideline is very conservative, um, but it is also something that we, we need to put in place as we build. Um, moving forward, you know, Burnsides are working with the, uh, there's at least four other engineering companies involved with our meetings. Crozier's and uh, CC Tatham are the, the main two for the developers, but they also have sub consultants working on things like the, um, uh, well, we have the assimilative capacity study that we're doing that we've initiated with Hutchison. Uh, DWD, I, I think is, it's anyway, Stephen O'Brien's got a company that uh, wastewater expert, um, they brought in an, an EA expert as well. So, you know, between all of these engineering companies, I'm sure we can come up with some, uh, some good things for Tremor. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ron, thank you very much for, uh, for that information. I'm looking to members of council. Tom, did you have anything further? I, I mean, what, what else can we help you with? It's a it, tough it, one. It's okay. I can be patient. It's a long-term project. It certainly is. We're certainly not talking about developments in 2023. And I appreciate the fact that uh, there are a number of projects that have to be brought together. Uh, not insignificant is the assimilative capacity study. Um, so um, I would appreciate if we could, uh, at significant points along the way, as you usually do, give us a, an update on the progress and start building a, um, a project timeline, or at least a master service plan timeline for the public uh, as well. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that is part of, when the master servicing plan is initiated, like, so after this meeting, um, you know, those things will all be, um, out and available for the public um, for their input and councils and everybody's really it's an open process okay i'm looking uh councillor broderick can i just look to see if there's anybody else okay councillor broderick go ahead uh just a simple question uh through you uh mr mayor to uh to mike um I missed the uh, the the time frame how often are we replacing the, the cassettes at this point so right now it's scheduled to replace half of them every, like they get replaced every eight years. So we're replacing half at four years, the other four, four at four years, the other four, four years later. Um, we, we got behind on that and we, we did try some different cassettes for those counselors that were around. Um, we tried a, a different company. Um, they, there was no change, right? They had a little larger pore size. They were made of Teflon. It, it just, it, did, it didn't work out as well as, um, you know, the manufacturer suggested it might. So we're back to the original uh, type. But once we get a pre-treatment solution in place, those cassettes should last over 10 years. Thank you. Okay. Onward. Uh, anything further? All right. If I could just add to Councillor Patterson's comments. It's a complicated process dealing with water and wastewater given that we have great demands and great pressures from our development community. So I'm encouraged to hear that the, um, uh, that our CAO is working with them to secure some of those agreements. I'm also encouraged to hear that we're setting up a plan that has some reasonable uh, timelines uh, for all the servicing, as in the water reservoir, the search for additional water, water capacity, um, you know, as well as uh, working with Cremor Springs, a major employer and an industrial uh, engine in our community. So I'm, I'm encouraged that this whole thing is all coming together. And I don't believe that we'll be able to solve it all here at once. But I, as Councillor Patterson asked, I would hope that we get continual updates on the progress of this. And, uh, and Council is brought up to speed on, uh, on all the aspects of it as it moves along, as it will be very interesting in our community to see it develop. So... That, that, yes, Mr. Ron, go one more time. 
the last thing. So I just I want to, you know, we need to thank the development community. It, it, it's it's a big project, an expensive project. Um, they've been great to work with. Um, you know, John could expand on on the different discussions we've had with them. I'm sure, but um, we we've got a good group there. So looking forward to seeing some good things happen in Creamore. Well, certainly. Thank you, Mike, for that. And, uh, you know, <laughs> the municipality is the community, but we build the community with our developers. That's clearly how it's done. We build our community and expand our community and make our community what it is with our developers. So we have to work together. And so I appreciate that. Good effort. Anything further on this? I have a mover and seconder on a motion. Anything further? Looking up and down the table. All clear. Okay. Madam Clerk, I have a mover and seconder, so I'm prepared to call the motion. All those in favor? And that carries unanimous with the exception of Walker, who is not in attendance, but thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you to Jeff Langlois as well, and thank you to the CAO. Okay, we're going to move on to another hot topic, community services. I imagine Mara Burton is standing by wanting to speak to us on this. This is the severing houses, surplus houses to farmers' needs through farm consolidation. This is a, uh, a very good topic. All right, be it resolved, the Council of the Township Clearview, who by one, receive report CS031-2022, severing houses surplus to a farmer's need through a farm consolidation dated June 13, 2022. And item two, support the policies of official plan amendment number 22 when reviewing applications for severances of farm houses as part of farm amalgamations. All right, to get this on the floor, a mover and seconder. Okay, Councillor Lamers, and seconded by Councillor Leishman again. Thank you. Doug, you got to get your card out a little faster than Councillor Leishman, okay? <laughs> All right, so we have Lamers, Leishman, thank you. Uh, Miss Burton, is uh, are you on board for this? Uh, hello, how are you there, Mara? I'm good, thank you, Your Worship. Good evening, Council and uh, staff and the public. Um, so the reason that we brought this forward is uh, just a little bit of a reminder that a couple of years ago, we did an official plan amendment because we had someone that was interested in doing a farm amalgamation to sever a uh, farmhouse surplus to their operation. And um, currently, our official plan requires that you have to be the two properties actually have to abut one another or be direct, you know, more or less directly across the road. Um, they can be a little bit off kilter, but basically they have to be, you know, a little kitty corner, but basically they have to be, to be amalgamated, they have to be very close to one another. <clears throat> Not all municipalities do this. Some municipalities allow a farmer to amalgamate lands uh, and they don't have a requirement as to where. And so, you know, we kind of knew that once we opened the door to uh, a farm that's two kilometers from another farm uh, to sever the surplus dwelling, that we would probably some, see some more of these. And um, we are starting to see that now. And, you know, really, we wanted this to be dealt with comprehensively through our official plan. And we still feel that that's the best way to do it. Um, but we wanted to bring forward this report so that we weren't doing these all as little one offs. Um, we really would like to deal with this through our official plan process. And we're doing very well with that now. We actually just today finished um, at the planning department anyway, going through all of the text of the draft official plan. And so we're getting uh, back on track to be able to hopefully schedule an open house soon. Um, so just to look into the state, we thought it'd be a good idea to do a bit of a state of the union of where we are right now with uh, farms in the township. And so we took a look at the different farm sizes and I don't wanna belabor the report, but basically we feel like we have approximately 1,384 parcels, like farm parcels in the township. Um, and we have probably around 222 uh, different farms, like farm corporations uh, or family owned farms or whatever, <clears throat> businesses, farm businesses. And so of course, a farm business can buy another property anywhere and they can consolidate that into their farm operation. However, if they want to sever a house that's on the farm, then they have to do it through a farm amalgamation because the province doesn't allow us to sever farmhouses anymore, um, like as retiring farmer or anything like that. 
So and as we were looking at this, we were lucky enough to come across a uh, study that was actually done or a paper that was actually done by uh, Wayne Caldwell and uh, Manley, now I forgot her first name off the top of my head, sorry, um, from the University of Guelph. And it's a fairly recent paper. It was from October of 2021, where they looked at this very thing. And they looked at a number of upper tier municipalities where a lot of these policies come from. And we were, I guess, surprised to see that there were a lot of quite restrictive policies out there in these um, upper tier municipalities. It wasn't all left to the lower tier municipality. And in fact, uh, Oxford actually has a point system that we thought was very interesting and something that you know we can look at through perhaps our official plan process. Um, but one of the other things, of course, and I think sometimes we forget this, is that the provincial policy encourages, not only does it allow farm amalgamations, but it also encourages all types, sizes, and intensities of agricultural uh, uses and farms to be protected. So I've said to you before, much like you know, providing for a variety of housing uh, for different stages in uh, uh, a person's life, that having a variety of farm sizes is also very important. And so I think, you know, through this process, what we found is that there were certainly pros and cons to severing farmhouses. We've heard from farmers who definitely are very pro, you know, sort of lift restrictions. And then we've heard from other farmers who've said, well, maybe we shouldn't be doing that. Um, and for various reasons, maybe to allow people to get into the market and start farming and things like that and to keep our, um, some smaller operations. And also we do not know where the future of farming is going. Uh, there's a lot of talk about regenerative farming now. Uh, which really protects the soil and provides not only do you have, um, are you growing crops, but you also have livestock on the farm. And this is particularly important when you have a house on the farm because um, farmers with any kind of livestock generally like to, and I'm sure any farmers out there will tell me if I'm wrong, but <laughs> my understanding is that farmers like to be close to their livestock. So if anything goes awry, they can be there and be responsive to it. Or they would have uh, an employee that would live on site that would be doing that sort of thing. And once we sever off a farmhouse, the provincial policy requires that we zone the, the farm property that we severed off to not allow the construction of a house. And this is obviously for the reason because to not start creating these residential lots in the agricultural area. So in the end, my recommendation and our recommendation is that we because we can't create these smaller lots and because we can't build houses on these properties that we have severed surplus, that we really need to look at holding the line so that we can protect our existing uh, farm base. Because we actually have a very nice variety of farm sizes right now. I've put some charts in the report that you can see. So we do have a good variety of, well, at least parcel sizes. Um, and we do have a significant number of farms. So I think now that we're starting to get some pressure in order to deal with some of these amalgamations through site-specific official plan amendments, it was really time. We didn't have time to wait for the official plan. We really wanted to bring forward this report to you to let you know that the department feels that we really need to um, stick at the very minimum with the maximum separation between a farm uh, and a farm to be amalgamated for severing off a house to two kilometers. And there's a lot of reasons in the report why we came up with that initially. Um, but I think this is going to be, this is kind of a stopgap measure while we work on our official plan. And maybe we look at some of these other uh, sort of policies that other municipalities have done, the point system being one idea uh, as we work through our official plan. So it's really here for your information and we're looking for some direction from council to support that two kilometers as a maximum at this time. Okay. Has anybody got any thoughts on that? I'm looking for questions. Good report, Mara. Yes, Councillor Patterson. Just an opening remark on just what you just said, Mara. First of all, I, I thought it was a very um, a good piece just to learn about the issues. I uh, appreciate the uh, the depth that you went into there. Um, when you said uh, it's it's just a stopgap measure, 
for the moment and uh, for my, our information. Um, are you suggesting that this is we're receiving this for information uh, or are we supporting, as you said, supporting but approving this stopgap measure until there's another review as part of our full OPA, that full OP? Uh, through through the mayor to Councillor Patterson. Um, it really looking for your support to maintain the two kilometers at this time. I don't want to fetter the official plan process because we haven't even gone to open houses or public meetings yet. So we may find that there is some additional things that we want to add to our official plan with respect to this uh, through that process. And now that we have become aware of this fantastic report by uh, Caldwell and Manley. Um, there may be some more details that we want to look at that we could include in our official plan. So this is really, uh, I don't want to say a forever. It's really, um, we would really like to hold the line at the maximum of two kilometers until we go through the public process through our official plan, in which case, Maybe we pull back the two kilometers. Maybe we open the two kilometers. Maybe we add other provisions. Um, I, I don't want to pre suppose the, um, the recommendation coming out of that process at this time. Yes, go ahead, Tom. And just a quick follow up to that uh, point, which I agree with. Thank you for that. Um, will there be an effort between now and when it's codified in the official plan in whatever form that we'll make a concerted effort to talk to the community, the farm community? specifically yes, yes. Um, through your worship to Councillor Patterson we have had a stakeholder session on this already uh, appreciate that COVID hit after that <laughs> we were lucky enough to have those sessions in person um, so we have had uh, quite a break in the time between we were engaging that community but certainly through the open house and the public meeting process yes uh, we're always open to engagement with the public but we have already held that stakeholder session and given that um, I, I, we do need to get this official plan in place. I don't really want to start the process all over again. Makes sense. Okay. Thank you very much for that clarity. Nothing further from any other members. All right. Again, thank you, Mara, for that clarity too, and that uh, it's um, efficient to be able to take those amendments from 22 and continue to support them uh, as we move forward towards an OP. So thank you. All right. Members of Council, we've got a motion on the floor. Anything further? I'm prepared to call the motion. All those in favor? That carries unanimous. Thank you very much. All right. Don't go away, Mara. Housekeeping. Housekeeping bylaw amendment number 2022. Uh, be it resolved that Council of the Township Clearview hereby one receive report CS 032 2022. It's his only bylaw amendment regarding housekeeping of 2022, dated May 25, 2022. Uh, the bylaw 22-26 being a housekeeping amendment to zoning bylaw 06-54 be presented to council for approval. Okay, over and seconder. Over on this side, Deputy Mayor and uh, Mr. Broderick. Deputy Mayor and Mr. Broderick. Hello, Mara. Hello again. How was your how is your housekeeping putting going? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think it's improved. Okay. Um, and uh, so I'll just take you through since our public meeting. Um, I, we have made some adjustments to the amendment. So originally uh, we were um, suggesting that the agricultural zone, I think I did actually speak to this at the public meeting, be uh, for farm sales, produce outlets and wineries and cideries be 30 meter setback to, because it wasn't really clear in the zoning bylaw. Um, so initially I had said to the lot line, but my thoughts now are to actually uh, dwelling, obviously not a dwelling on the site, but a, a neighboring dwellings. Um, and I think that that will allow for some flexibility in the agricultural area, but still protect the neighboring dwellings from any kind of processing that may take place. Uh, we also have proposed to just leave the semi-detached definition alone so that we can ensure that we don't actually build semi-detached houses that we didn't intend to on properties and that they're integrated into the dwelling. Uh, we have adjusted the um, the driveway for, there was a request, I, I also spoke to this at the public meeting, to move uh, an EP 
So just to give you a little background, we have a number of houses that are in the EP zone. And when we do come across them, we do like to take them out of the EP with a, a regular sort of amenity area around them. We don't want to go too far with it, but we do want to at least recognize them. And I'm going to speak more to this uh, a little bit later. So with that one, there was a driveway that was just outside the EP. So we just had to move that lot line over a little bit. And that was on 2531. And it doesn't even say what road that is but you'll see later on somewhere I missed that um we also removed 1180 1560 side road from the drafting error uh from the MA1 zone to the rural uh again to the point that the owner didn't want it and also that the federal aerodrome license crosses that property and so that would be a you know potential opportunity for an expansion to that airport um, we have removed 7760 County Road 9 from the zoning amendment from EP to rural uh, based on the concerns that the Conservation Authority raised. This was a barn. I do believe that this issue has been resolved now with the Conservation Authority. So it's not a house. So it is, I agree with the Conservation Authority. It's a little bit of a different situation there. So we have taken that into consideration. And then we have also removed a little bit less lands. Um, of the EP zone along the backs of 15 and 17 Elgin Road, again, to acknowledge the Conservation Authority's concerns with how close those backyards are to the river. So we did make some adjustments there. Um, you'll see in the report that we, um, I, I've provided you with the air photos of each one of the environmental protection changes so that we have tried to keep them quite close to the site of the dwelling and, and just a reasonable amenity area around each one of them. Um, the Conservation Authority did express a concern in regard to the definition of development in the provincial policy, which basically says if you need a planning application. Well, in my opinion, these houses should not be in the EP. These houses were all constructed with building permits properly prior to these properties being zoned environmental protection. So they are legal non-conforming buildings. They do still have to get permits from the Conservation Authority. And frankly, I just think that leaving them in the EP just causes some additional red tape that isn't needed, particularly in today's uh, concern and market with housing being such an important uh, priority. Um, so I comfortable with the uh, housekeeping amendment. We tried to keep it small and um, good, you know, what e easy to understand and um, not too onerous for the public uh, or anyone. So uh, we are recommending that it be approved by council. Certainly happy to answer any questions. Again, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the uh, the details that have been put into this work because it's it's housekeeping amendments like this to so keep it all in order. Members of council, yes, Councillor Patterson, I see first. I'm looking for anybody else. And go ahead, Councillor Patterson. So uh, again, appreciate the report. I did note the disagreements in the previous during the public meeting as well with the NVCA. It seems that you've satisfied. I take your argument uh, that perhaps what the NVCA is saying, development in the sense that the land could return uh, to a, a new development. Um, but your comment that it's not likely to happen, I think is probably a reasonable approach. So do we have a uh, consensus, at least agreement from the NVCA that um, this disagreement, if it's still there, would not lead to complications to the individual landowners or there, is there some work we have to do with the NVCA? Um, through your worship to Councillor Patterson, I, I do not know where the NVCA stands on this. I suspect that their position hasn't changed. Um, other than maybe the couple of tiny little adjustments that we made, um, but um, I'm still prepared to recommend the approval of this housekeeping amendment as is presented to council. All right. Could could I ask, uh, and I, I'll take your reconsideration of this if it tends to be uh, too complicated, that we at least attempt to reach an agreement with the NBCA based on what we approved tonight, <clears throat> so we don't have the burden carried by the uh, homeowner. Uh, if there, if any of this would lead to a difficulty in getting a permit, if I could, I'm not quite sure what you're looking for me to do. If I do have the bylaw for council uh, for consideration tonight. 
So I'm certainly happy to follow up with the with the conservation authority. Of course, there is an appeal period. Hopefully, it doesn't come to that. Um, but if you're looking, I, I you know I I can certainly follow up with them. I'm I, I'm not quite sure what you want. I'm sorry, Councillor Patterson. <laughs> Well, we, we are going to say, uh, uh, let's say we approve this as it goes forward and the NVCA still doesn't agree. What does that place the homeowner? What position does that place the homeowner in if they're asking for, uh, let's say, an extension of their home? <clears throat> if Is I could, I don't think... Going to see I, that as, sorry, go ahead. Oh, thank you. I Well, they still will require a permit from the Conservation Authority. I think it actually puts them in a better position with the Conservation Authority because it comes down to, to strictly just a permit and not necessarily a, like a permit on is the building safe and not necessarily as much of a thorough review through the provincial policy. And I think that has been one of the challenges that the public has had is that they've had to you know, although they already have a dwelling there, if they're doing an addition, they've had this higher test than another person who is in the exact same position, but doesn't need a minor variance, let's say. Um, so I actually think this evens the playing field and uh, puts the um, homeowner in a better position and allows the conservation authority to focus on what's really important as far as uh, reviewing a permit through the conservation authority and not having to concern themselves with the planning aspects of that, that which could be more fall to the municipality. Are we comfortable? Time will tell. Well, I just, I just think <clears throat> the request that's still hanging over me is <clears throat> the, the NVCA's suggestion if they were to, going to go along with this, that they would want a, um, a study done, natural heritage study done, is that what it was? Yeah. Well. I'm happy to speak to that a bit more. I, I, I gotta say, uh, I, I kind of feel that the opinion of the director uh, actually stands very well with the homeowner, that the home homeowner would have it the does. Township of Clearview would be clearly supporting. That, that's my point. I, I support what we're doing here. Right. I'm happy to hear that uh, that Mara feels that it, it does uh, give the homeowners a better position. Correct. But that's my point. Is that uh, uh, not intentionally, but have we shifted the onus of making this argument now too much to the homeowner when the NBCA says? that they would recommend a natural heritage study be conducted in order for the authority to support the removal of any environmental protection areas. Anyway, but I'll, I'll take the advice of planning. I mean, Mara, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, th thank you, Worship. Um, I, I understand the concern. Um, we were careful in ensuring that we really only looked at the disturbed area so I'm not really sure what doing an environmental impact study would actually do, what the result of that would be, because these areas are already disturbed and they were constructed legally at the time they were built. Um, and I think that that has a lot of weight. And so I don't feel it's necessary that we do an environmental impact study here. I think if somebody is looking to build in the environmental protection area, um, they then they would need to do an environmental impact study and Certainly. then they would need to do a zoning amendment. But at, I don't feel that it's appropriate um, to have them do it for doing an addition to a house that's existing, you know, in a cleared area. I just, I, I don't, I just don't think that's reasonable. All right, that's clear to me. Everybody else comfortable? You good? Okay, I'm looking for any other questions. Members, I don't see any further. Anything further, Tom? You're looking at me like you're unsure. I, I, I think it's something that I can uh, actually uh, inquire because of my role on the NVCA. And yes. If, okay. I, I'd like to put the onus on them to be reasonable like us. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I'd like to put a lot of onus on them to be reasonable, <laughs> period. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. Members of council, nothing further then? All right. I'm. I'm prepared to call the motion if there's nothing further. 
All right, I'll call the motion. All those in favor? And that carried unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. Uh, okay, don't go away though, because it looks, I don't know, is this, she's Rosalind maybe or uh, Roz? Okay, Roz has got the next one. I acknowledge that there was a conflict of interest on this next item. So, um, Ms. Deneen, you can step down. Uh, this is the zoning bylaw amendment for 40, 143, 145 Mill Street, Cremor. Uh, be it resolved that Council of the Township of Clearview hereby one, receive CS033 2022 zoning bylaw amendment one for 143, 145 Mill Street, Cremor, uh, dated June 13, 2022. And item two, that bylaw 22-45 for the lands municipally known as 143 and 145 Mill Street and legally described as part lot 13, part lot 14, plan 315, formerly in the town of Cremor, now in the township of Clearview, be presented to council for approval. Okay, a mover and seconder on this motion, please. Councillor uh, Councilor Patterson, thank you. And Councillor Lamers, thank you. Well done. And uh, is that Rosalind who would like to speak to this? Hello, Ros, how are you tonight? Hello, Mayor Measures and uh, Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this application. Um, I just wanted to give you a bit of uh, maybe some background. Um, we have been working on this application since April 30th of 2021. And you will recall that um, we actually held a public meeting in August 23rd of 2021. At that time, we did receive quite a few comments from the public and from agencies. And um, we are also at the same time processing a site plan application, which will deal with um, a number of things, including implementing if council decides to move forward with approval um, of the bylaw tonight, um, it will implement obviously the zoning. And um, so just to remind you that there is still an ongoing process of review in terms of uh, you know, technical engineering and um, just implementation, as I said, of the, of the bylaw. Um, I did want to just highlight some of the things that the, the proposed zoning bylaw will do. And um, just as a refresher from the public meeting. So we will be looking at eliminating or prohibiting a couple uses um, in this zone. And that is as a result of our wellhead protection area. And we have worked with Brian Post, um, who is our RMO at the uh, Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority. And he um, has helped us with um, looking at two uses that we're going to uh, prohibit, prohibit. One is a dry cleaning establishment and one is a, cre a crematorium. And we also will work with Mr. Um, a post as we move forward with um, looking at site plan approval um, and looking at um, some policies in there in our agreements. Um, the other thing that we're going to look at with this bylaw is um, the um, fact that the site will provide 10 parking spaces um, on the site, uh, one of them including a barrier-free site, a uh, barrier-free parking space, um, that there will be no loading spaces on the site, um, that the parking areas will be set back a 0.9 meters, just under a meter from the interior side lot line. But in those areas um, where that setback is, that the um, we're actually going to require um, the landscaping will be put in planting beds along the, that side to help again buffer the sides, um, the the neighboring properties. Um, and the other thing um, that this bylaw will do is that it doesn't require any snow storage on site as we will work with the owner and um, require that that will be trucked off in the future. Um, that will also be a clause in the site plan agreement. Um, and another thing I just wanted to point out that we will be putting a hold symbol, a hold 25 on this property. Um, and there are three things that we are looking for um, to be met before we come back to council and have that hold lifted. And one would be that the adequate municipal services are available to the site, um, that the cash in lieu payment for nine deficient parking spaces pursuant to the current cash in lieu bylaw 0037 are met. 
and that finally the site plan approval has been obtained and any agreements have been entered into with the township. Um, and that concludes my remarks. I'm happy to answer any questions that council may have. Okay, thank you very much, Roslyn. Um, good report. Is there any members of council with any questions to the report? Looking up and down the table. Councillor Patterson, go ahead. No, no. All right. Um, Rosalind, during the public meeting, one of the issues uh, that came up, um, and you've made reference uh, to some of them in your report, was the, um, uh, the request to make sure that the tenants that live above the, um, the adjoining property, the pub, were, were their access to their, their living quarters were not interfered with, uh, given the fact that it's construction going on. And I appreciate the note that um, they have to be patient and communication between the existing building and the new construction site uh, is important. So um, I have heard concern from the, the pub owner that, that he's not clear if, um, in fact, I understand that the at one time, it was thought that perhaps the tenants would, would have to vacate the province. And I take your note uh, in response to some concern that um, it's unacceptable that they wouldn't be allowed to access and that steps would be taken through, I guess, throughout the construction process that um, their need to access the property, uh, their, at least their home would be, uh, would be safeguarded. So, is that matter adequately resolved? Rosalind? Uh, thank you, um, Councillor Measures, and through you to Councillor Patterson. Um, thank you for the question and or, and or comment. Um, and I might just um, take you back to um, the, the beginning when we had the first site plan. Um, I believe the owners um, did intend to actually um, expand onto the pub owner's lands. There is an aisle between the two properties and that that aisle does access um, um, or it's like a little laneway that accesses the apartments to the pub owners. Um, at that time, the current, the, the owner of the, the subject land was going to actually um, work on those both lands so on the laneway as uh, so the on others property and was going to you know redo some of the um, the say the pavement there or put in tiling or whatever um, with the new the we have received a revised site plan that has actually taken all of the work that was going to occur on others lands off of it and they will be working solely within their property limits. And um, at this time, um, th that can't really be addressed if I may through say a zoning amendment, but we are going to obviously reinsure um, everyone through the site plan approval that um, the owner is going to work on his own property. Own property. Thank you. Okay. And another matter similar to this is that one time there is uh, was a fire escape uh, whose location uh, perhaps was in dispute in terms of uh, was there uh, was it in a location that put it on part of the development property? Has that issue been resolved? Thank you through um, Mayor Measures. Thank you, Councillor Patterson for that question. Um, and again, that is, um, I think beyond a little bit the scope of this zoning bylaw amendment. Um, and my understanding is that again, that the current owner will work on his own property, um, keeping in mind that there may be some um, civil matters that have to be dealt with throughout the process. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I did have, uh, and I did make a query uh, with the um, with the BIA because they did raise some uh, points as well, uh, some to do with the uh, parking. My understanding uh, is that the BIA has been satisfied. So, 
Are you finished there? I'm done. I was just looking over to Councillor Broderick when you mentioned the BIA. Did the BIA discuss that at a BIA meeting, Councillor? They did? Okay, just checking to make sure. Great. Good. Thank you. If no one else has any questions, I've got two quick ones, real, if you don't mind. Um, you mentioned uh, the plantings, uh, planting beds, uh, as to create a little bit of a buffer. That's uh, basically back at the um, where the parking would be. Is that correct? Okay. Is yeah. there any consideration for snow removal and planting beds? They kind of conflict each other a couple of times. Is there any consideration on how that's going to work out? That the planting bed will survive a attack of a plow and blower. <laughs> Um, thank you, Mayor Measures, for the question. Um, and I think that in my uh, vision, envisioning of the planting beds, that it will be a raised planting bed, not necessarily a flat, um, okay. flat to the ground. Um, and does that help with the snow removal question? Well, I, I think it does because obviously, you know, it's, it's just clearing the snow away. If there's a, a structure there, you're going to have to move around it. Okay. So that's right. clarity, simple to there. The other aspect about this whole project too, um, at the public meeting process that you mentioned was in 2021, uh, it was clearly laid out that the building would have a, at the Southern portion of the building as it faces uh, Mill Street, it would have a jut back where there would be creating kind of a plaza space, uh, effectively making more sidewalk space by offsetting the building angle a little bit. I think that is uh, in this plan now has been eliminated. Is that correct? Uh, thank you, Mayor Measures. Uh, yes, it has, um, there was a bit of a, yes, an irregular sort of frontage to the building. Um, and due to comments that were received by others um, through that public process, uh, the owner and the architect have um, decided to straighten the frontage and and um, make it sort of perpendicular or straight to the to the to the road. Right. So it'll be congruent with the other buildings on the street, and the sidewalk will simply have straight lines uh, that it was originally. And this uh, proposal that was presented in the public meeting is actually not what we're approving tonight. Correct. You are correct. The, okay. The, yeah, and there will be, I just will mention that one of the complications um, that was discovered is that there's a, a hydro pole or an APCOR pole that is directly outside of um, or in front of this, this proposed new building. And one of the challenges that had to be overcome was that there needed to be a three meter setback from that. And that pushed the building a little bit further um, in um, off of the sidewalk. Um, but it will still remain flush to the sidewalk. Okay. Well, if there's hydro poles involved, <laughs> one of these days, this council is going to see a project to remove hydro poles. So we'll see how that goes. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, if there's nothing further, members of council, I'm prepared to uh, present this motion. We have, uh, we got a mover and seconder over here. So I'll tell you what, I'm prepared to call the motion. All those in favor. And that carries unanimous. Thank you very much. All righty. Roz, are you talking to us about County Road 9 as well? I, I am. Okay, yeah, just checking. And welcome back, Councillor Deneen. And she's going to make her way up here, so I'll just read this. Uh, zoning bylaw amendment for 5328 County Road 9, new law, recommendation, be it resolved, that Council of the Township of Clearview hereby one. Receive report CS034-2022, zoning bylaw amendment for 5328 County Road 9, dated June 13, 2022. And item two, that bylaw 22-44 for the lands municipally known as 5328 County Road 9 and legally described as lot 10, part of lot 21, plan 116, formerly in the Township of Sunnydale, now in the Township of Clearview, be presented to Council for approval. Mover and seconder on this motion. Looking this way, Councillor McKechnie and Councillor Broderick. Thank you. Hey, Roz, what do you want to tell us about this project? Hi, hi, hi again. Um, so just a, a refresher. Um, we did have the public meeting presentation on May the 25th of 2022. 
Um, if you recall, this is a property that has an existing house on it and the current owners, um, their end game, I suppose, is that they're going to create a new lot, a new residential lot. Um, but in order for that to occur, um, there has to be a zoning to change the actual zone um, from the residential large lot or RS1 zone to a uh, residential low density exception zone or an RS2 zone. And in that process, um, we are also going to have to recognize for the existing house, um, a side yard setback of 3.3 meters um, and, uh, and allow this development to occur on partial services. Um, and for the new proposed lot, um, we will be looking at an altered provisions for minimum lot area, which will be 668 meters and a minimum lot frontage, which will be 16.5 meters. And additionally, we will allow these um, development to occur on par partial services. Um, and that concludes my review. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. All right, thank you again, uh, members of council. Any questions to uh, Roslyn regarding this County Road 95328, County Road 9? Not seeing any questions. I think it was a very good report and it was a good meeting that we had. All right, uh, I don't see any reason to hold to a delay. So uh, we have a mover and seconder on the motion. I'm prepared to call the motion. All those in favor. Thank you. And Mr. Burton has also voted in favor. Thank you, unanimous. All right, thank you, Rosalind. Good to see you tonight. We're gonna to move on to the CAO administration department. We have the corporate or the annual corporate report from 2021. So that's kind of nice to finally get that done. Uh, I'll put it on the floor. Recommendation, be it resolved. Council of the Township Clear, we're here by one. Receive report CAO 001, 2022. It's the 2021 annual corporate report dated June 13, 2022 for information. Can I have a mover and seconder on this motion? Mr. Broderick, Mr. Ms. Leishman, thank you. Mr. CAO, do you want to speak to this briefly or it's a, it's, it's a very good report, good information. John? Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. I, I want to uh, extend my appreciation to all the departments that assisted in putting this together. They did a great job. Uh, it's a very, you know, it's a high level review, but it also ties us back into our strategic pillars. And you'll no, notice that as you go through the document, how it ties it all together. So it's a high level review. It sort of indicates what has gone on in the past year. And, it, and surprising, uh, many things occurred in this past year, despite COVID and other, other factors. So it's uh, uh, commendable to all the staff and the work that they've done in council as well. Thank you very much for that. Yes. <clears throat> Any uh, members of council with any questions of the report? Yes, yes, it's Councillor McKechnie. Hi there. Go ahead, Doug. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I uh, just uh, wanted to mention that uh, I appreciate these annual reports, and uh, this one is particularly good, and it's a, it's a great overview. And if anyone's uh, thinking about running in the election in uh, October, uh, whether they're sitting at this table or not, this is a, a great document to look at to inform the public when they go out campaigning. This is a, a super document. So anyway. Well, thank you for that. You're right. There is a lot of great information in there. So uh, it's well worth reading and taking a look at. Um, if I may, uh, through the clerk, I would imagine that some copies of this, perhaps hard copies, would be available both here at the Administration Center and perhaps even in our libraries. We can make them available if necessary. Thank you very much. Nothing further, I'll call the motion. All those in favor? And that carries unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. CAO and staff. Okay, here's another report, uh, a little lengthier, so give me a second. Uh, CIO 002, Climate Action Report, recommendation, be it resolved, Council of the Township Clear, we're here by one. Receive report, CIO 002, 2022, Climate Action Report, dated June 13, 2022, and item two, appoint a Climate Action Committee following the community engagement process and draft terms of reference. Item three, direct the CIO to confirm full membership in the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, FCM, and further the CIO recommend to council for the opportunity and participation of interested councillors in the various FCM committees that focus on climate protection and funding opportunities. 
Item three, recognize a climate crisis exists and direct staff through the CAO to continue their work and to implement the most recent best practices that reduce emissions and through increased community engagement, practices develop with the greater community, economic and social resiliency, while recognizing the increased probability of sudden climate events. Item three, approve and schedule a council staff workshop on a community economic development, uh, on community economic development, take the A there. Uh, and item six, direct the CAO to create readiness for a community economic development process and to implement an initial community engagement discussion with service clubs, the Cremor BIA, the Clearview Chamber of Commerce, and the Clearview Townships Community Halls. Okay, can I have a mover and seconder on this motion, please? Uh, Mr. McKechnie and Mr. Broderick, thank you. Mr. CAO, would you like to speak briefly about some of these? It's, it's I like having recommendations that have six items. You almost reminded me of Councillor Patterson's motions. How's that? <laughs> hey, that's respectful. I'm being serious. It is. Go ahead. I, I take it as a compliment. <laughs> um, I, basically, uh, what I was trying to accomplish is uh, Council knows what they've asked me to do under my performance review. And, uh, and I also, uh, Council voted on uh, resolutions by Councillor McKechnie, and I'm trying to bring them together so that we're doing it at one time. And so um, I, I believe in order to do that, we have to do some work in the community to get people looking at our community from a similar lens and uh, establishing what they feel will be the gaps in that process and or the future needs. And uh, this can lead to a variety of different outcomes and, and priorities. And, uh, and then we can implement the action afterward. It's, 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 it's an extensive process. I'd like to discuss with the community first what the process would look like. It'll give council a chance to determine how they want to proceed. There will be a cost associated in, you know, in the long term of this, of this mandate. But ultimately, if, uh, if for example, uh, the community is looking to have a climate change action plan, for example, what kind of work are you doing with a lot of your volunteer groups, for example, and how they participate in a sudden climate event to say if we need warming shelters or if we need other types of shelters or evacuations in the community, for example, if there is a climate event that forces people to you know, relocate, for example, what are we doing with the community so that they know what their role is and we know what their role is. So there's a bit of work to do when you're when you're dealing with this process and uh, I'd like to start by, you know, suggesting that we all look from the same lens and then start it with that. That's basically what I'm saying. Thank you for the report and thank you for the update. Members of council, do you have any questions to Mr. CAO? Mr. Mr. McKechnie first, and Mr. Patterson second, go ahead, Doug. Uh, thank you, your worship, just one second. I've got it written down here. Um, Just uh, wondering about the uh, community engagement process. Uh, yeah, I'm a little bit uh, concerned there, John, because you know you've got the uh, uh, service clubs, Cremor BIA, Chamber of Commerce, and the community halls, and uh, you know I don't know that uh, I, 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 we seem to have left out you know the uh, the environmental community out of that. So that's that's one of my concerns is. Uh, uh, the uh, what are your plans for that? I mean, uh, for the environmental community, I, I'm uh, fully prepared to meet with any of those organizations. Um, I basically was uh, dealing with some of the groups that deal with a variety of different areas, and some of those people may be a part of those groups as well. But if there is a specific interest group, I'm prepared to meet with them. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, I think that's uh, important because, uh, you know, there, there definitely is a, a, a specific interest group and, uh, and they need to be a part of this. The other thing too, that I guess I have a question about is the, um, uh, the strategic plan. My impression was that we were going to uh, include the climate crisis in the strategic plan. So you're talking about 
you know, uh, replacing or, you know, developing this community economic development strategy in, in place of the strategic, strategic plan? Is that what you're what you're it's it's really a part of two one is a, for an economic development strategy that, which is a part of the economic uh, development advisory committee but also to tie in a community economic development plan as a part of the strategic process so for example um in the original motion it was asked that i make uh, climate a strategic priority i, I have no problem with that and, and i absolutely anticipate it'll be a part of it but those priorities will be set by council at a later date and knowing from what i'm hearing in the community now i i absolutely see climate as being a part of the process and will be probably be recognized but it's not for me it's not for me to say at this point in time because we haven't gone through that process yet okay so and then the uh I, the workshop then that will be we will flesh it out there in in the workshop is that what you're planning the community economic development strategy um it absolutely identifies natural capital uh, uh in your natural spaces your environment in, in the climate as uh, the key piece of the entire process uh, frankly if you don't have natural capital you really don't have anything else so it's an important ingredient within the five capital set I'm going to suggest is the lens we use. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Good questions, uh, Councillor Patterson. Yes. Uh, first of all, thanks for the quick action on climate. <laughs> so I appreciate, and 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 to some extent, uh, because it's some moving parts in this, um, it would be helpful if you laid out in some order of action how you going to implement this. I, th I think you've given us a good, good framework where you're going. Um, so if you if you could follow up with, with just you know, essentially like you can't join, join like what what are the what things are dependent on uh, doing first before you can accomplish? Sorry, I didn't quite. Did you say like a Gantt chart? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So we can just see the progress and how we might. And, and, and again, I think this is uh, to to uh, Councilor McKechnie's point about engagement. This is uh, uh, important, and I would say to some in the community, a vital interest, and they want to be part of it. And um, and so maybe they we, with uh, with that lens that we look through their their view, they can see where they their role is. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Like for, for example, you, you look at this social environment that's in your community. This involves all the various interest groups, environmental backgrounds, economic backgrounds, to uh, you know their recreation and their culture. All those uh, social groups in the community are so important. There's a high value to that. And so, how are we investing in the social groups? How are we investing in human capital? Are we uh, you know, working together with citizens so that they understand the obstacles that this council will face in making some of its decisions. And it helps council if the public understands what they're facing. And ultimately, we're looking at uh, making sure that we use the environment in the way that it needs to be used and protected, but also understand that we have an economy and we have to still be able to use aspects of our environment in a conscientious manner but still creating local economic activity. We don't have a lot of control over the global circumstances around the world, such as high gas prices and, and, and other matters. But what can we do locally to make sure that our community is strong from an economic perspective as well? Yeah. So it's balancing all those issues. Thank you. And, and one, one other point on the engagement side, uh, just as a suggestion, because I, I know it worked, I saw it when, um, when uh, Terry Vashon and the uh, Recreation Culture Plan did his uh, his community engagement process, where he actually called people to a room. In this case, it was in New Lowell, and, and and they were invited to share their ideas, both individuals and representative groups. And and they can and those people in in that form can identify themselves as an interested individual. This is what I'm prepared to do, and the groups can identify themselves. Um, and, and the other one that I think that had a good spin off was the one that was done 
uh, privately by the by the community, the public at large, was the um, it was a village green exercise, which was a good community planning, and and it really it really brought together uh, common views and 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 the uh, desperate views in seeking China a solution. And I think that's the that's going to be the battle uh, uh, that we're going to have is how do we meet our municipal goals and yet still do that environmental sensitive and sustainable ways you know and make make those words meaningful in, the, in that case not just slogans so I, my suggestion is that we would we would not just invite groups if they want to talk to us to come but actually outreach if, if yeah, yes exactly and, and so my my initial approach is to just get a sense from the community when I describe the process the process to them and, and basically ask them to look, we'll need your help. We'll need your involvement. And uh, if you're gonna lift a community, it's gonna require more than just the council and administrative staff. It's gonna involve the community. It's gonna involve business. It's gonna involve farmers and it's gonna involve, involve the environment. And so how do you lift the community with all that process? You've got to get them on board with how you want to approach it and ultimately try to balance it as best you can. And that's all we can ask of them. And I think that's all they can ask of this council. And uh, I'd like to put that uh, process in motion. It, it, it won't happen overnight, but uh, the first process is to start that initial discussion to allow people the opportunity to warm up to the idea and then uh, engage a, a more detailed engagement process. All right, thank you. Members of council, anything further? Again, I'll compliment the uh, the CAO for uh, for this report. Um, as uh, Councillor Patterson pointed out, the timeliness of it is uh, very much appreciated, and so thank you for uh, preparing it and putting some deep uh, deep thought into into the entire strategy. And we look forward to uh, to supporting you as a council uh, in in moving this forward. So uh, certainly come back to us if there's anything further that we can do to assist. All right, thank you. Members of council, you've got a mover and a seconder on the motion. I'm prepared to call the motion. All those in favor. And that carries unanimous. Thank you very much. All right. Now, I just want to point out that the CAO has been super busy because he prepared three reports for this meeting. <laughs> How about that? Mr. CAO, we've got uh, CAO 003, Traffic Calming Policy and Speed Reduction Legal and Insurance Opinion. Um, okay, recommendation, be it resolved that Council of the Township of Cleary hereby one, receive report CAO 003, 2022. It's a traffic calming policy and speed reduction legal and insurance opinion dated June 13, 2022 for information. Mover and seconder on the motion. That would be Councillor Patterson, Councillor Lamers. Uh, Mr. Uh, CAO, again, I'll give you a moment to speak about the report if you wish. Uh, yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this it really it relates to referral motions that occurred at the last meeting. And uh, to be specific, I was requested to get uh, two legal opinions and, uh, and to seek uh, an opinion from our insurer. So the first legal opinion regarding a traffic calming policy was to determine if Clearview Township, in fact, was working within the policy. The second legal opinion was sought to determine if a speed reduction or non-speed reduction proposal would create any additional liability to the township or council. And the third opinion was not a legal opinion, but rather an opinion from the townships insurer. And I provided those and I provided the summaries of each. So it's now on your table. I, if I, and if I may, your worship, the clerk can maybe describe where we are within the motion process yeah. with the referrals, what has been passed, what can go to a bylaw for the next meeting and what further work may occur with the other resolutions. So I, I would I would do that in a moment. I'm hoping that council may have any questions specifically about the direct content of this report before we ask for the next steps. So has anybody got any questions or comments about the uh, reports that the CAO has uh, gathered from legal and uh, insurer? Anything? Mr. Patterson, yes. I guess when I, when I reflect on, on these opinions, um, the thing I noted uh, throughout um, the two reports from our lawyer, and and then the one um, opinion on the risk management from our from Marsh, our insurer, was the um, we're, we're best protected from 
uh, uh, the words that I used here was negligence. If we were if we were acting, which is a key word, in good faith. In good faith, of course, of uh, course, absolutely. Okay, so in that sense, um, and there was um, there was an acknowledgement on on the part of the traffic calming policy that we were proceeding in the direction as we intended. So that was, I think for some of us, we thought we were. So it's comforting, and I hope the public finds it um, useful to know that we were following our process, um, including some references to traffic calming policies, which may apply uh, in all parts of the township, as as uh, the staff and uh, our engineer noted in the recommendation. So, so I think there was some consistency there as council was working through. Um, I also took um, note of the fact that uh, the question I think was answered in terms of are we uh, raising any liability in the choices that we've made to act on the recommendations that staff and the engineer made. And, this, and the specific applications that were made um, to this council, um, which we have approved and then uh, you know we're, we're reconsidering um, was speed reductions. So uh, while I may continue to think that that was a, an, an efficient way of doing it, and there was note uh, in the report that it was an acceptable way of doing it, um, it still comes back to um, what is good faith. Um, what do we do if it's not speed reduction? Uh, do we still acknowledge the fact that um, the design constraint the language I saw in all of these reports still amounted to um, our our obligation to ensure safety on our roads, and and so I'm left and 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 looking forward to the discussions we'll have on do we go forward with our original um, staff well, report again that'll be part of our next discussion right or uh, but all in in that. Um, um, if it is good faith, I don't see good faith as no action. Okay, this 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 said clearly to me, uh, action should be taken based on the report, and if if not speed reduction, then what? And that's that's an an open question right now. I still don't. I can I can state what I think. In discussions I've had with the public works. Uh, okay. what the alternatives would be but that's what we'll consider later on so I, Again, I, I reflect on it's a good report it is a good report and that's what i'm hoping that we're having discussion about the content specifically of this report because this is simply a motion to receive for information right, right. all right so i'm i'm hoping that we're going to complete that little process and then we'll interject with an education session from our clerk okay so in a moment members of council anything further Yes. Oh, there we are, Councilor McKechnie. Questions on the report? Um, thank you, Your Worships. Yes. Yeah, so I, when I read the report, just to follow up on what uh, Councilor Patterson was saying, uh, so I looked at uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Agnew's uh, report from uh, the insurer, and uh, towards the end here, matter of fact, you know what I'll do? I'll go back to the paraphrased portion, which is in uh, uh, the CAO's report. Just bear with me one second here. And it says, uh, bear with me. Okay. Um, you know, the Councillor Patterson was talking about uh, acting in good faith. So the insurer states the township shall act reasonably and in good faith, keep roads in good state of repair, remediate uh, deficiencies in a timely manner. And uh, then it goes on to say, establish mechanisms to assess existing roadways for any risk and establish me mechanisms to assess new roadways at the proposal stage for any risks. Example, visibility, curvature, road condition, and consider the appropriate speed reduction measures and ensure the measures are in place when the roadway is opened for public use. So that to me uh, is, uh, I, I, that's basically what we did, is it not? When we went and had the 
traffic assessment study done and we got the reports from the Mr. Senton, the expert. We uh, assess the existing roadways for any risk. And uh, we're now, and then we considered the appropriate speed reduction measures. Is that what we did? I, I, effectively, it's what we did. I think the comments from Mr. Agnew, though, are, are more directed and, in fact, clearly directed to new builds and new construction or reconstruction of roads. So uh, if, if a road is being reconstructed, yeah. much as concession 10 is right now, that's where we need to apply some of those considerations of engineering standards, right? And that's to speak to Mr. Patterson's point. That's where we have to listen to those standards and use them when a road's being reconstructed. I don't read it that way, but uh, is that something that we will be debating or discussing at the next meeting? Hopefully. Uh, okay. If I may, I'd like to go to the CAO. Mr. CAO, is that is, is that sort of how your... The, What's your conclusion from Mr. Agnew's assessment of that comment about new roads? Yeah, so um, establish mechanisms to assess existing roadways for any risk and establish me That's mechanisms to assess new road roadways at the proposal stage for any risks. So the example of we are we did I examine many roads, but to be specific on concession 10, that was a new reconstruction and at that i wasn't here at the time uh it was early in 2021 council determined that that would be now 60 kilometers an hour not 80. so they assessed it at the pre-development time period and that's what you've done you've stuck to that 60 kilometer aspect of concession 10. so that one you have implemented other roads that you're uh, that are under under construction if they've been assessed under the study, I'm not sure what they said. If there was a reduction needed for all the roads that were under reconstruction in the county or in the uh, township, no. um, I think you're okay there. I don't think they suggested anything. I think they suggested sp speed limits for other roads. Council asked them to go back and look at certain things to see if it could be reduced. They came back and made some recommendations on reducing speeds on certain roads. I think so, what the report can tell you, and it may have been, and Councillor Patterson can correct me on this, um, if, for example, you don't do a speed reduction on a certain road, can you use other types of traffic calming tools to, you know, warn uh, drivers and or to make the road safe? And, uh, and I believe you, you have that ability. So there is a bit of flexibility here for Council. But uh, there's several tools that you can use. And I think this is going to lead to the best possible decision you can make as a council. Okay. But I'm comfortable with that. I, I would like to acknowledge that uh, Mr. Perot has popped on the screen. I don't know if he has a yellow card or not, whether he wanted to speak. But I'll give him a moment. Mr. Perot. Thank you, Worship. Uh no, I was just coming on just in case there were questions for, for myself as part of this discussion. Okay, thank you. I just I saw you. I just want to acknowledge you. Go ahead. Uh, Councillor Patterson's next. Yeah, yeah, I think I agree with what um, what uh, CAO Ferguson just said. I just it's pretty plain in here that uh, and, and, and while I didn't say it, I fully agree with Councillor McEchnie when I read uh, the um, the report from uh, uh, from Marsh, it essentially outlined what our staff has done for us. Correct. Okay, and and so I saw that as an affirmation of the process that we were working. Um, the selection of the actual process, um, I think our, our our opinions are well known, in favor, and so did the engineer and the, and their staff. We favored a speed reduction. However. The township, when, when in the actual letter from Marsh, it says township shall establish a mechanism to access, and he underlines it, existing roadways for any risks, you know, that is speed, visibility, curvature, road conditions, and, and, what, and what the engineer referred to as design constraints. And, and then he went on, second paragraph, township shall establish a mechanism to assess new roadways. So it's both. And, and that would make sense because the immediate concern would be in terms of risk assessment, 
would be our existing roads. And then the expectation would be having set up the framework that he we adopted and he actually right. parallel that would that would obviously apply to new builds. So I think it was a pretty holistic way of looking at it and uh, puts it in, I think, in a good position to go forward as you. Yep. All right. So I think uh, I think this has been a good discussion. I think this is a good report. It gives us some clarity as to what council has asked for. So um, I'm, I'm asking that council would support this. And then I'll, like I said, I will go to our clerk for an, a small education session. So I have a mover. Anything further? I have a mover and seconder on the motion. I'm prepared to call the motion. All those in favor. And that motion carries unanimous. Thank you, Mr. CAO, for your work on this. Uh, I'd like to pause the process here before we go. Actually, we're going to go to the legislative clerk, clerk section. Look at that. That's next on our agenda. So, so there you go. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please outline for us, uh, given that Council's now received this legal report, what the status will be on the motion to reconsider uh, on two items and I guess the outstanding motion for a bylaw on one other. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. So what we are proposing to bring forward procedurally to the June 27th council meeting, uh, if you guys remember back on um, March 21st, there was a motion to reconsider um, the speed reduction on Fairgrounds Road, it passed. Um, so the original motion was brought forward. It was referred back to staff for a legal opinion, which uh, council received tonight. So the procedurally, the best thing to do is bring this motion back to council at the June 27th meeting. The same goes for the speed reduction on Riverside Drive and Concession 6 North. It was reconsidered at the March 21st meeting. Um, the original motion came onto the floor and at that time, council decided to uh, refer back to staff for a legal opinion, which you guys received tonight. So that original motion will come back forward to council on June 27th. And if you remember correctly, um, concession 10, that one was not reconsidered. But when we came to that bylaw at the March 21st meeting, um, just so that there was consistency, we referred that one back to staff uh, for a legal opinion. So that bylaw, not the motion, the bylaw will come forward to council for approval at the June 27th meeting. And that was um, bylaw 22-17. All right, thank you for that education and information. So council will have that opportunity to discuss that at the 27th. Okay, let's speed past that issue and head straight to other issues from the legislative department. Members of council, uh, LS013, it's an update to board and committee appointment policy recommendation, be it resolved. Council of the Township here by hereby one, receive LS013 2022, update to the board and committee appointment policy, dated June 13, 2022. And item three, that council approve the updated board and committee appointment policy as attached as Appendix B to this report, and item four, that the revised policy be effective immediately. Mover and seconder, please. Mr. Lamer, seconded. Deputy Mayor, thank you. Madam Clerk, you got some brevity on this one? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Actually, I would like to call Kayla Reimer, our committee coordinator. Kayla. She wrote this report and she was um, proactive in reviewing our current appointment policy and um, making recommendations based on her, her work with our committees and boards. So Kayla, if you want to turn on, on your microphone and, and your camera and address council. Hello, Kayla. Are you there? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, council and staff. How are you? Great to see you again, Kayla. Yes, nice to see all of you as well. Uh, so tonight I'm presenting the updated or unupdated appointment policy as we approach the 2022 municipal and school board elections this coming October. Uh, as you know, with the new term of council comes a new term of board and committee volunteer appointments. And the clerk's department felt this is an excellent time to review the current policy prior to the upcoming election and subsequent appointment process. So the report outlines a couple changes and additions to the current policy uh, to quickly highlight a few of them. An addition of definitions to add the clarity and context, an outline of the application and appointment process, both at the beginning of a new term of council and during the term of council. It also defines the ways uh, in which advertising, advertising for vacancies will occur. 
And it's in an updated format and has some consistency uh, remedies with the procedure bylaw. So the clerk's department's looking to have the updated policy effective immediately as we prepare for the new term. All right, thank you very much, Kayla. I appreciate that. Please don't go away in case there's any questions. Members of council, any questions to Kayla and or our clerk? Yes, I see you down there, Councillor McKechnie, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, through you to uh, Kayla. Uh, Kayla, I just uh, I, I uh, went through this really quickly. It, was there any consideration given to uh, the maximum number of board members on our committees? So, oh, you, sorry. You, you know, you know, sorry, you know the problem that we're running into with Duntroon, yes. like thirteen board members and, and such. So, okay, Kayla first, and then the, the clerk. Go ahead, Kayla. Yeah, so through yourself, your worship, to Councillor McKechnie. Um, absolutely, uh, the maximum and minimum numbers should probably be put in a memorandum of understanding or a terms of reference that's created uh, for each individual boarding committee, as many of them have differences um, in what they do. That being said, in the proposed policy and the update, it does allow for a maximum to be kind of stipulated as soon as um, council appoints a specific number. So that first number, um, if there is no terms of reference or memorandum of understanding in place, that initial appointment would be the maximum number at that time. Um, so in the case of say Brentwood, if, if uh, five members were appointed to that at the beginning of the term of council without a terms of reference or MOU, five would be the maximum. Councilor okay. McKechnie. Thank you. You're good, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm good. All right, thank you. Okay, just checking, uh, excellent. Uh, Madam Clerk, did you wanna supplement to that? Um, I'll just echo Kayla's sentiments there. We specifically put that provision in this appointment policy, knowing that our current MOU with our hall boards is silent on maximum members. We do have a minimum threshold of three. Um, so we understood that we're going to work towards um, developing terms of reference with those boards uh, throughout the next term. But to get us to that point, we felt that council at the beginning of term could establish their maximum number, and that's what we would work with throughout the term. Okay. Um if I may, I'd ask through the CAO that the senior management team, including the recreation director, work with the clerk as they're in the middle of preparing MOUs and, and uh, operation procedures for each of our small halls, for sure. Uh, but there are other boards that we need to consider, such as our uh, youth center board and, uh, and so on. So we have other boards beyond those that have sort of current MOUs. So just hope that you can work towards that as a team to... Uh, Bring that to fruition. Well done. Any other questions to this group? Yes, Tom, I see you go ahead. It always coming from our clerk's office is always a lot of thought that goes into these things. So could you just summarize just quickly, maybe the top five, three reasons why we're, we're refreshing it. I've been doing this for so long that when I read the words, you know, I'm, I may be reading more into it than I should or not enough. So just we'll go to the clerk first. You're the experts. You tell us why are we doing this? The top three or five. What's the benefits? Of doing uh, this? Uh, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Um, uh, through your worship to to the rest of council, it's just good business practice to review all of our policies, especially as we're going into a new term of council. We always like to consider these living documents. There's always room for improvement. Um, so we're going to make this uh, a four-year kind of annual review with council about our appointment policy, because as you know, throughout that term, little things can pop up, gray areas that we may need to clarify. So we just want to make sure that we're constantly reviewing our policies to make sure that what we're doing in practice makes sense. So, Tom? And one closing comment. You probably know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Is there room in this process to ask the people who are on boards and committees uh, as they're closing out their term uh, to make suggestions about uh, how, how much they enjoyed being on a board or committee and would like it to stay the same and, and uh, improvements? Is there, yeah, is there any thoughts to uh, an exit interview for our, many of our committees if they're willing to give it to us? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Patterson, and I, I don't know if Kayla wants to chime in here too. I actually never thought about that, but that's a really good idea, having a survey with our, 
or outgoing members or members who want to apply again, just seeing what their experience has been. And that way we can kind of fill in some gaps there and, and volunteer engagement because um, they know their committees and boards kind of best as they've worked through them. And they know those little, little pits that probably irritate them or those red tapes that they consider that irritate them. And we can work at, at making that um, a little bit more of a streamlined process. So we are, we're for doing something like that to end the do you, term. Do you want a friendly amendment or do we just, and I'm prepared to do it just on trust? I don't believe we need a friendly amendment because this is specific to the appointment policy, but we can definitely take suggestions of just doing kind of an outgoing survey with our current volunteers and just asking them questions and feedback um, in the last few months of their term and taking that information. And if we feel we need to make an amendments with the new term, we can bring a report back with those comments. My recommendation on that very good topic, and it's a good point, would be that you do a communication uh, to all the volunteers and advise them, one, that there's going to be a change in this policy, and two, that the uh, process would require in, in the next term, coming November or sometime, that they would uh, need to reapply for the positions. And if they'd make their, no, their wishes known ahead of time, that assists council, the new council in making decisions. So I think that's a good idea. So I think that just simply comes from communications from the, um, the clerk's department and or the clerk's coordinator. Sound good? This is good stuff. Anybody else? All right, council, I'm prepared to call the motion. Those in favor? That carries unanimous, thank you very much. Moving forward, LS014 encroachment agreement application for 794071 County Road 124. Be it resolved, council, the township clear you hereby one, receive report LS014. 2022 encroachment agreement application for 794071 County Road 124, dated June 13, 2022. Item two, the council approved the application for the encroachment agreement uh, submitted by Daryl Robinson. And item three, that a bylaw authorizing an encroachment agreement with Daryl Robinson for the encroachment onto the township road allowance known as River Street be presented to council at the June 13, 2022 regular meeting. Members of council, could I have a mover and second on this motion? Looking in this direction. Councillor Leachman. And Councillor Deneen, thank you very much. Any questions or sorry, Madam Clark, you got anything you want to say on this or is there? Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Worship. I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, just a portion of the garage is encroaching on the road allowance on River Street. Um, the applicant to apply for building permit, not to um, create any more square footage of the garage, just to refurbish it and to move forward with that building permit. We just need to have a formal encroachment agreement in place because one currently is not. Always good to find these things out before you start doing things. Good stuff. Members of council, any questions? Seeing none. I'm prepared to call the motion. All those in favor? That carries unanimous again. Thank you. LS015, extend electronic meeting participation. We're certainly electronic tonight. Okay. Recommendation be it resolved that Council of the Township Clear be hereby one receive report LS015 2022. Extend electronic meeting participation dated June 13, 2022. Item two, that in accordance with section 2.6 of the Township Procedure Bylaw, as amended, Council approves extending electronic meeting participation for Council, Committee, and Board members for a period of one year, expiring May 4, 2023. Uh, okay, mover and seconder. Uh, Mr. Broderick, seconded. Mr. Lamers, thank you. Um, can I just ask a quick question before we move on? Uh, it's, it's, it's okay for us to make a motion that, uh, because it's, it's in the procedure bylaw that goes beyond our term, correct? Um, correct, Your Worship. So the way the procedure bylaw is written is that it's extended from the date that the uh, uh, state of emergency has been revoked. Um, yeah. So the state of emergency for the county was revoked on May 4th. So that's why. May 4th, yeah. I get it. Perfect. And it allows, it allows the new term of council to proceed forward based on whatever health restrictions or lack of health restrictions that we're dealing with at that time. It just gives some business continuity there. I like the way you said that health restrictions or lack of health restrictions. Members of council, any questions? No, seeing none, I'm prepared to call the motion. All those in favor? Right, carries unanimous, thank you. Okay, council, we're gonna go to bylaws. 
8.30ish, so to speak, on the old clock. Okay, Council. Bylaw 22-26, zoning bylaw, housekeeping items. Recommendation be it resolved that bylaw 22-26 being a bylaw to regulate the use of lands and character, location, and use of buildings and structures on lands within the township of Clearview be presented or read a first, second, and third time finally passed on the 13th day of June, 2022. To the right, Deneen, seconded. Lamers, thank you. Any questions? All in favor? And the bylaw carries, thank you. 2244, uh, zoning for 5328 County Road 9. Recommendation, be it resolved. Bylaw 2244, being a bylaw to regulate the use of lands and character, location and use of buildings and structures on lands municipally known as 5328 County Road 9. Legally, excuse me, legally described as Lot 10, Part of Lot 21, Plan 116, be presented a read of first, second, and third time finally passed on the 13th day of June, 2022. To the left, Mr. Deputy Mayor and Councillor Leishman. Any questions? Oh, sorry. Hold. Is that no questions? Okay. Um, I'm prepared to call the motion. All those in favor? And that carries. Thank you. Sorry, you had me confused over there. Um, the next item, uh, Councillor Deneen has a conflict, so she can step down just for a moment. 22-45 zoning bylaw amendment with 143, 145 Mill Street. Recommendation be it resolved that bylaw 2245, being a bylaw to regulate the use of lands and character, location and use of buildings and structures on lands municipally known as 143 and 145 Mill Street, Cremor, and legally described as plan 315, part lot 13, part lot 14, be presented to read a first, second, and third time, finally passed, 13th day of June, 2022. Again, looking left. It would be Mr. Patterson, Mr. Lamers, Patterson Lamers. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, was there? All those in favor? <laughs> Carries. Thank you. I'm looking right on the next one. <laughs> 2246. This is the appoint the building inspector, Mr. Jacob Fleer. I met Jacob the other day. It was really nice to uh, to run into him. Uh, recommendation be it resolved that bylaw 2246 being a bylaw to appoint a building inspector for the township of Clearview be presented a read of first, second, and third time finally passed on the 13th day of June, 2022. Mr. McKechnie, Mr. Broderick. Any questions? Welcome back, Councillor Deneen. All those in favor? And that motion carry or bylaw carries unanimous. Thank you. Here's one that's special to all of us, 2247. We need to appoint a municipal clerk, Ms. Barbara Kane. Recommendation, be it resolved that bylaw 2247, being a bylaw to appoint a municipal clerk for the Township of Clearview, be presented at read a first, second, and third time, finally pass on the 13th day of June, 2022. Deputy Mayor, Councillor Patterson, thank you. Any questions? I'll have one question. When does she start? Actually, thank you, Your Worship. We're very excited to have Barb Kane here with us. She actually started last week, um, and she will be clerking her first council meeting on June 27th uh, with the support of the clerk's department. So this is my last meeting here. Uh, so Barb's a great fit for Clearview, and we're very lucky to have her. Outstanding. I'll call the motion. All those in favor? Bylaw carries unanimous. Thank you. All righty. Uh, we've got one that slid in here too, 2249. This is the encroachment agreement for 794071, uh, County Road 124. Uh, recommendation be it resolved that bylaw 2249 being a bylaw to establish an encroachment agreement between Daryl Robinson and the Township of Clearview for encroachment onto the municipal road allowance known as River Street uh, be presented to read a first, second, and third time finally passed 13th day of June, 2022. Looking left, Deneen Lamers. Thank you, Deneen Lamers. And any questions? All those in favor? Thank you. You guys are wondering because I look to the right and say left, right? So just so you know, from my theater background, this is obviously stage left, stage right, because we're on TV, just saying. Just, just saying, that's how it works. It's, it's okay. Notice of motions. I don't think there's any notice of motion. Nothing tonight. Bylaw to confirm the proceedings. 
We have a bylaw to confirm. Recommendation, be it resolved, bylaw 2248, being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the June 13, 2022 council meeting, be presented or read a first, second, and third time, finally passed, 13th day of June, 2022. So moved. so moved by the deputy mayor, seconded by Mr. Broderick. Thank you. All those in favor? And that carries. Motion to adjourn. Before I read the motion to adjourn, Madam Clerk. As you mentioned it just a minute ago, I have a note to ask you about this. This is your last meeting for at least probably a year. And uh, we wish you all the best. And uh, you and your family are, are growing. And we're so excited that, uh, that you're making your home here in Clearview Township as well. So although you have uh, served us just for this short time, you are just on leave and you're coming back at a future date. So we look forward to that and wish you all the health. Thank you very much. I'm excited to come back and I can't wait for you guys to meet our new baby girls. So. I can't wait to see the pictures. That's for sure. Well done. Yep. She's a trooper. Boy, you should see her working around here. I tell you. <laughs> back and forth to the photocopier. All right. Motion to adjourn uh, council recommendation. Uh, be it resolved that council adjourn at what are we at here at? What was that? 835? Uh, 835, sounds good enough for me. 835, Dep uh, that would be Deneen, and seconded by McKechnie. Why, well, thank you. All those in favor. And that carries, here, here. Have a wonderful uh, 